All right, here we go. Ari Spears, welcome back. That's right. That's right. This is becoming a regular thing now, you guys can say. Yes. So we make it magic here. Yep. Yep, we hurt a lot of feelings last time. Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is what we do. Yeah. This is yeah. what we do. And you got your own podcast. You want to shout it out at the beginning this time? Let's do it in the beginning. Spears and Steinberg, available on all streaming platforms. Hit me up on Instagram. Slide in my DMs. I will happily chop it up with you and send you the link. Also, go to our YouTube channel, Spearsburg Pod. Hit like and subscribe. There we go. Start from the beginning. You know what I'm saying? Read it from the beginning. Go from the beginning. It'll make sense to you. Get the callbacks, characters, the whole thing. Don't start from the middle or the end. There you have it. There you have it. All right. We have a lot to talk about today, but we cannot start this show Uh without talking about Cat Williams. First of all, do you have a relationship with Cat at all? No, other than uh, when we see each other, what's up, what's up? So just the what's up, what's up? Yeah, that's it. Have you guys ever done shows together? Uh, once upon a blue moon ago in the early stages mm. of, I think, kind of both our careers. Okay. So you just happened to be at the same club yeah. performing. Not, not even, I think we did, there was like a, one of those theater shows Uh huh. where they got like four or five comics on the bill. Okay. Okay. Well, he just had an interview with Shannon Sharp. Yeah. And he just went full scorched earth. Yeah. He led a bunch of major comedians have it. Some of which I know personally, a lot of which you know personally as well. What was your whole take on overall what he did? I want to kind of give you the cliff notes because I, I, I set out a post about this. Um, and I know you'll probably chop this up because it's it's in, in terms of my response, it's a little lengthy. Okay. Uh, but I thought what he did was, was extremely unnecessary hmm. uh, and useless. Um, and the first thing I said was, and believe me when I tell you, the amount of flack that I am catching behind my post, is like, I'm like uh, Scarface, balcony scene. I got a thousand Colombians coming to me. And I say <laughs> hello to my little friend, but I welcome it. Um, because my whole thing was this, uh, I felt like, did it move the needle? Did it make us better? Did it, did it, did it, you know, what was the point of it? other than the fact that it, it was a news cycle. And I had said that, you know, one thing about my people, black people who I love dearly, and I said, I love all people, but you know, my people come first. But we love drama, man. We love drama. We love, we, it's, it's that whole crabs in a barrel mentality. You know, we love the shit. We love to go, and, 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 I, and I made this clip because I was seeing all the responses on, on Instagram. Oh shit, oh yo, cat on his shit today. I'm clutching my pearls, he shook up the world. <laughs> and it's like, you know, it's like, you know, niggas in a rap cipher or a battle rap cipher or, you know, being at school on the playground and there's a row session. Did you hear what he said? And I'm just like, look, man, let's keep this in perspective. He ain't curing cancer. He ain't solved racism. He, haven't, he hasn't cured black poverty. Uh, he's not curing AIDS. This is a news cycle. And this shit is the hot news of the day. And when it's over, we'll be on to the next news cycle. So my point is, people calm the fuck down. Stop acting like he put the world on its axis. Because at the end of the day, it doesn't change anything. Everything he said about, from everybody from Chris Tucker to Ludacris to, you know, Steve, Ricky, Cedric, uh, whoever Hart. else he slammed, who, who? Kevin Hart. Kevin Hart. He even mentioned me. He didn't say in detail. He just said, Aries is one of my... Yeah, he did. He goes, oh, okay. He goes, Aries is one of my enemies, and I have to be able to something with my sight. Wait, wait, wait. He said you were one of his enemies? enemies? And I was scratching my head because I'm going, what did I do? Have you mentioned him in the past in any Vlad interviews? I mean, interviews? I, not in any Vlad interviews, but I'm in an interview I have, may have mentioned what everybody else I believe truly knows, is that, you know, at one point, you can't tell me the cat didn't have a drug problem. And even though he was on Shannon Sharp going... I've never done a drug in my life. Yeah, Nigga, never please. Never done a hard drug in his life. Nigga, yeah. you, know, you fighting a 14 year old. Stop it. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? You canceling shows, you late the shows, you know, you're belligerent, you did shit's popping off. So it's like, stop it. But, you know, right now we in the, the cult of cat. Everybody's fucking, we gotta, we gotta, uh, uh, what's that saying we like to use? We gotta protect cat at all costs. Mm -hmm. You know, cat. Like, again, unless this motherfucker is curing cancer, Solving black poverty, solving racisms. What are we protecting? 
It's a fucking news cycle. Calm the fuck down. You know, and my whole thing is this. What does it change? It, it, Steve Harvey's fans, Cedric's fans, Chris's fans, Kevin's fans, they all going to still be their fans. Yeah. It ain't going to stop their momentum. Mm -hmm. It ain't going to stop their paper. It ain't going to disrupt their careers. It's going to go on. Because we comics, we're like pastors. And our fans is our congregation. And congregations ride for their pastors. Mm. So nothing stops. So what's the point? And, 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 and I'm thinking, you know, while we all talk about this Cat Williams situation, I'm going in this very same at that very same time, you got Taraji P. Henson on camera uh, crying and moaning about the fact that her and her black female uh, actress peers, a la, a la Vi Viola Davis, Alfred Woodard, Gabrielle Union, uh, Sanaya Lathan, um, they don't get what their white female co counterparts get. And my whole thing is in instead of talking about who stole this joke or who did this to whom or who said what to whom, why not use your platform and your voice for the greater good? Why not f try to figure out how we could come together as it black entertainers in Hollywood and make it so that we don't have to keep coming to Hollywood hat in hand asking for them to feed us when we need to be fed. Create our own shit. Create our, our own award shows so that we don't have to wait on them to give us our flowers. Mm. Well, let's address that shit. Instead of who stole jokes from what? Because if you really want to be honest about it, and once this thing started to get the ball rolling, people had pointed out that, listen, Kat talking about uh, Cedric stole a joke, Steve stole a joke. There are two jokes that you could say Kat stole. J.B. Smoove on Def Jam, when he did the joke about the greatest intro music ever, cut to Kat's most, one of his most popular specials where he's in a tuxedo. Same fucking joke. Mm. So it's like, you know, again, being petty about who stole what and who said what to whom, so what? Life goes on, the game continues. What difference does it make? What do we gain from this? Why not use us to benefit us instead of this bullshit? The other interesting thing is, is, is as I said, you know what makes this social media thing so dangerous is because it gives the ability for people who normally wouldn't be heard from a platform. It gives them a voice and it gives them the illusion of power that they don't have. I saw so many clips where people cut together now, music, eerie music and clips that you know has false information. Right. Kevin Hart's fan base is dwindling. People are leaving him. <laughs> They're unfollowing him because Cat exposed them. We must use our powers to buy a public to stop the Illuminati to put an end to these devil worshipers. Shut the fuck up. Kevin Hart will be just fine. Yep. Kevin Hart is one of the biggest movie stars, ticket sellers of arenas on the planet. You honestly think that because uh, whatever your name is that works at fucking Popeyes, you done cut together a clip with some eerie music and because you stating false propaganda that Kevin Hart's career is in trouble over a news cycle? Nigga, knock it off. I recently, and we talked about this before, to go on a, on a little tangent here, there's Carlos Mencia. When Joe Rogan confronted him on that stage and that video started to go viral, Carlos Mencia himself said he went from stadiums to small clubs First in Iowa. First of all, Carlos has never done stadiums. Not stadiums. Okay, well, big venues. Big theaters. Okay, big theaters. Big different stuff. Okay, you're right, you're right. He went from big theaters to small clubs big in middle America. The difference between Carlos and Kevin. Now, again, Carlos, Carlos had a hit show. A history of doing this and was exposed brutally. Kevin Hart is not known for stealing jokes. He might be known for having comedic writers, but he's not known for stealing jokes. And he's known for one of the hardest work ethics in the business. So did those two, that's like compare apples to grenades, nigga. Now, no. I, I understand, but I'm just saying that this has happened before. Yeah, but did you- Someone's throwing a monkey wrench to someone's career and sometimes it sticks. Ke Kevin Hart is- I'm a, not saying it's gonna happen here. I, I know, but Kevin- I'm not saying different it. Different stratosphere. I, I understand. Different stratosphere. I understand, but at and, one and, point, and he, but even Carlos still, Mencia was no joke. He had a hit show. He, he, was, he, was, he was- He was still in He jokes. was doing- Listen, I, I don't know about that. You know, I'm telling you from the comedic community what it was. And then you had documented evidence of verbatim 
jokes. Now, again, and, 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 and a lot of comedians will tell you, listen, at one point in their career, you stole from somebody. You, 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 whether it was an influence from Richard Pryor or from whoever it was, nothing is 100% original. But at the end of the day, Steve Harvey, Cedric, Ricky Smiley, Kevin Hart, Chris Tucker, their positions in this game are so solidified and respected and the longevity they have, their fans aren't going anywhere. Even when Carlos was going through what he was going through, what was fascinating to me was when you saw the footage of Joe Rogan uh, 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 in the confrontation at the comedy store, somebody yelled out a girl. Yeah, but he does it better. In regards to the joke that Joe was saying Carlos took. Yeah, but he does it better. Your congregation is loyal to the pastor. Right. So believe me when I tell you, this is why I'm going, all that shit Kat said, it's not changing anything. Well, you know, for example, I had T.K. Kirkland on here recently. I <laughs> saw And uh, number one, he said that, you know, Cat Williams used his catchphrase, who raised you? And, when and I read the comments and every black person went, that's not that's not a phrase that you made up, TK. So many black people use that in the, in the community, in the household. My grandmother said that. My aunt said that. My mother said but that. But that was his catchphrase for a long time. Right? When you think of who raised you and you say comedy, yeah. there's only one person that comes, comes to mind. Yeah. He has whole comedy specials called Who Raised You. But you know, you know what TK said? He said, who cares? I don't care. It's a joke. And he said, it's one thing, he said, in the world of comedy, it's one thing to steal a joke. It's something else to steal a whole routine. Yeah, verbatim. Yeah. Routine, like routine. a whole comedy yeah. special, like your yeah. whole 20, 30 minutes. Right. Yo, you do jokes, whatever. You do a joke for a couple of minutes, you go to another 20, 30 jokes, and then whatever. One little joke in the middle of a whole routine, TK said, who cares? There's a difference between stealing a joke and stealing someone's set. Yeah. See, your set is your whole show. Right. An hour, 45 minutes, hour, 30 minutes. That's your whole set. Yeah. A joke is less than maybe 30 seconds, maybe two minutes. Yeah. Sit. Right. So what I explain to people, if you had $1,000 and someone stole 100 would you throw away the other $900? Yeah. It's, it's petty. Right. And everyone's going through the same experience in life. They're seeing the same thing. They've seen the you know, they're watching the same news. They're looking at the same social media. I do an interview. Someone else might ask the same question. Who cares? Who cares? Honestly, who cares? Who cares? Is You're not going to do my exact same interview. Right. And even if you did, who cares? Who cares? You know, they brought up this whole Cedric thing where, you know, there was this one slightly less known comedian. He did this joke and then they played the Cedric joke and it was almost word for word. Whatever. It well, the, the joke, the joke where he talked about uh, "Call Me by My Initials." There's an actual clip from Designing Women, verbatim, the joke. Who? Cedric. Cedric. Yeah. Verbatim. And Designing Women was out before Cedric was known to be a comedian. Right. Now, again, if you want to look at that as a smoking gun, as a aha, got you moment, fine. But my point is, what is it changing? I don't think it's changing anything. And he, here's the thing. The amount of money that Shannon Sharp made from those 50-something million YouTube views is less than Cat Williams gets for one show. I think it's really chess that Cat is playing. He knew that if he went on this platform and let everyone have it, his ticket prices will go through the roof. It his drama sells, doesn't it? His audience will, everyone will want to see what the follow-up is to this interview, and he's going to pocket a few million dollars in the process. And at the end of the day, you know, uh, people talk about uh, selling your soul. You know, that's that's one of the things he talked about, you know, and that's one of the things that people are putting them up on their shoulders about is they're going, hey, man, he fucking stood his ground. It's about integrity. Well, if it's about integrity, let it work both ways, you know, because at the end of the day, if, if that's, and listen, we don't know for sure that was his M.O., but let's just say it was. He made a chess move that benefited him, that benefited Shannon Sharp. Yeah. But at the cost of what? Now, now comics are beefing. Yeah. Now there's gossip in the air. Now the community within Hollywood and the regular public, in terms of black folks, we can we're continuing this same cycle of divide and conquer. How is this helping us? Because my thing is this: if we could stop the bullshit 
and come together in terms of black Hollywood and have our own studios, have our own dream works, like with Def, De, uh, David Geffen, uh, Jeffrey Katzenberg and Steven Spielberg. Yes, we got Tyler Perry, but he's all we got. If we could have nine, 10 Tyler Perry's, well, well, wait fifth, a minute, let me fifth, finish. 50 Cent just started a studio in okay, Baton Rouge. Oh, so great, two. Two. But yeah. what I'm saying is if we could really do that in mass numbers and the force that we know our, our, our buying dollar powers can generate, well, then now that we've done that, now we can take that money and funnel it back into our own neighborhoods, our own ghettos, our own streets. Yeah. And we could start building up, not just in terms of black Hollywood, but then also us as a community and as a people. Wouldn't that be the better thing to do than, than fucking talk about a new cycle that's going to come and go? That's meaningless? And that continues to keep us bickering like fucking schoolgirls? Yeah, it's a great chess move for Cat. Yeah. And great that, that, that uh, Shannon Sharp can get some of the crumbs. But then past that, who does it benefit? What's the point? Uh, yeah. I mean, the thing about this interview is that pretty much everyone that he called out responded. And that's what made the interview so big, is that suddenly you have Kevin Hart's fan base saying, oh, what's, what's this interview about? You know? Everyone, we're all, we're all. Michael Blackson's fan base checked it out. Everyone's fan base, Ludacris's fan base checked it out. Everyone's but it's not fan for base. the re. It's, listen, and and, I, and again, when you when you read some of the comments, oh man, cat got niggas shook. Niggas is holding a press conference, which is funny, <laughs> but nonetheless, <laughs> there's no press conferences being. Held. But nonetheless, listen, we're all ego driven. We're all entertainers. We're all men. So, if somebody is talking shit, you no matter how much you want to try to pretend it don't bother you. You're not going to dress it. You, you, you know, at the end of the day, we're entertainers. We have egos. We're human beings. We have egos. We're men. We have egos. So the ego in you and the man in you goes, nah, fuck that. Let me respond. Mm -hmm. So that's just a natural given. Yeah. But again, man, I, I, I just, you know, listen, the, 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 my proudest moment for real is recently Dave Chappelle spoke out on it. At a con Did you see this? I saw it. I was about to mention that. I think, was was at, uh, that, I think yeah. it was at uh, the Improv on on uh, Mo Better Mondays, and uh, and and uh, him and D Ray were debating about it on stage, and I'm like this. As far as I'm concerned, Dave is our generation's Richard Pryor. He is the goat, and the fact that the goat agreed with my take, then not that, not that he said that personally, but we had the same stance. That's good enough for me. That's good enough for me. Right, and his stance was. How come you didn't diss any of the white boys? Cat's attacking all the brothers, but it's like, uh, and, and and I think Charlemagne even alluded to the same thing. He's like, you know, you talking about, uh, I wish I could, I, I, if I try to paraphrase it, I'm gonna butcher it. But he worded it in such a way, it was like, you you attacking all the brothers, but you, the puppets, but you're not attacking the puppet masters, the guys who really pull the strings. And I wonder why that is. I'd be, I, I could I could speculate all day. Well, he shouted out Gary Owen in a positive way. In a positive way. Yeah. But, you know, whether whether it's Steve, Ricky, any of us, we're not the ones who signed the check. And the one thing about Hollywood that I've always said, especially pertaining to black people, is you sit there and you wonder, how come we don't take more of a stance? How come we not more vocal? How come we don't unite and do this and this and this and this? Because we don't want to bite the hand that feeds us. Well, there's a lot of uniting. I mean, the Kings of Comedy is an example of of, an, of a very dope unification of the biggest comics of that day. That's small potatoes compared to what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the boardroom, in the offices, the suits. Yeah, they'll always allow us to put on a uniform and play. Can we own the team? That's the difference. We're talking about ownership. We're talking about real shit to make a difference. We could play all day. They love when we play. But now let's, let's 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 talk about ownership. Mm -hmm. Let me own the franchise. Let me get on get in on that. That's a very private club by design. So that's what I'm talking about. TK says something interesting. He said, "Cat Williams, Dave Chappelle, and Kevin Hart are popular. Eddie Murphy is on a whole different level." Well, Eddie. And he said he said he's been around Eddie before and he's seen it. The rock star level of an Eddie Murphy, none of these guys could touch. 
until you become bigger than Eddie Murphy, you're not a rock star. Yeah. I mean, you got Cat Williams, right? You got Kevin Hart. You got Dave Chappelle. Eddie Murphy is here. And Overall, I, yes. I seen it with my own yes. eyes. That man is on a whole nother level. I seen it with my own eyes. I hung with them for months. Seen it with my own eyes. He was something that cannot be explained. Do you agree or disagree? Uh, you know, listen, Eddie, Eddie, I always said when people ask me my top, you know, what's my what's my Mount Rushmore? Mm -hmm. And then I don't include Eddie. I don't include Richard because I go, they're not Mount Rushmore. They're Mount Olympus. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a whole nother. So my Mount they're Olympus. Sky yeah, my Mount yeah. Olympus is Eddie Murphy, Richard Pryor, uh, uh, Red Fox, and uh, George Carlin. Okay, yeah. My Mount Rushmore is Dave Chappelle, Patrice O'Neill, Bill Burr, and uh, Tommy Davidson. Mm. So, you know, as far as that goes, and, and plus, Eddie's so far removed from what he once was. Not saying he's still not iconic and great, but he's just a different Eddie now, 60-something. Wait, is he that old? Yes, he's in his 60s. Hold on a second. Eddie Murphy. Yeah, you're right. He's 62 yeah. years old. He's going to turn 63 April in a couple 3rd. of months. Yeah, April That's 3rd. my birthday. You know, oh, okay, you guys yeah, have the same birthday. we're both Aries, yeah. Okay. Um, hey, wait, is that how you got your name? Because you're an Aries? Yeah. Oh, okay. I learned something new today. Um, I don't know if I said this on your podcast. I believe I did. But it, my perspective on Eddie has been this. We got two Eddies. You know, in the 80s and 90s, we had the Chicago Bulls Eddie. Now we got the Washington Wizards Eddie. <laughs> okay. Still a legend, still an icon. Yeah. He just ain't putting up 30 and 40. Yeah. But he's still averaging 22. He's doing good Christmas movies. Yes. Though. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he's doing his thing. Well, one of the things that Cat Williams said is that Kevin Hart is an industry plant. Now, people love this whole Illuminati industry plant. What did he do behind closed doors to get the position yeah. that he's in? Yeah. Did he compromise himself somehow to some old, you know, motherfuckers rich need, executive? They, motherfuckers need reasons to validate the fact that they, they, they're not successful. Yes. And they're not where they should be because their hopes and dreams have been dashed or because they never had the guts or the know-how to pursue their dreams and be who they wanted to be. Thanks. I never believe, listen, I'm not naive. I do believe that, listen, this is Hollywood. And when you're dealing with people with ego and money and prestige and the ability to change your life, are there people that take advantage of their positions in terms of power? Mm -hmm. Of course. Yes. Has there been the casting couch? Of course. But this whole Illuminati boogeyman shit, I never bought into that. Yeah. I never bought into that. And I think it's more geared towards women than men. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like... Oh, no, there's some powerful dudes gay, that want to suck some men who and probably put the pressure on you. Put the pressure on you? I don't know. I've never... I mean, but I'm not in Hollywood like that. So right. I, I don't know. But you could say that this exists, and I'm sure it does to a certain degree, but at the end of the day, these are all businesses. A lot of them are public companies with shareholders. When you're playing with $20, 30000000 million... You're not going to put the dude that sucks your dick on that has no talent whatsoever because you well, owe him a favor. Maybe his talent was in sucking your dick. Right, but that's not going to translate to the screen, right? Unless it's a porno. Maybe not, but, <laughs> but under the intoxication of a good blowjob, people lose perspective. Yeah, I don't know, man. At the end of the day, people lose their jobs over a bad project. You know, as someone who has a business, I never cross any sort of line like that because I'm like, yo, there's too much... There's too much money at play here. There's too many people that I have to support to, to do something sideways just because they gave me a favor of some sort. Nah, I'm cool. I put you on because you deserve to be on, and I don't put you on if you don't deserve to be on. You know, now Harvey Weinstein did his thing, and he went to jail for it. But is Kevin Hart industry plant? No. Does Kevin Hart work his ass off? And it's probably very agreeable and easy to work with, unlike other people in Hollywood, I'm sure he is. Listen, Kevin, and I think Dave Chappelle said it in one of his specials, it might've even been equanimity, but he said, basically, Kevin does everything right. He, he's, and, and again, when I say what I'm about to say, 
I'm not in any way trying to slander Kevin Hart, but you just alluded to it. Hollywood loves agreeable people. They don't like assholes. Yeah. They don't like rebel rousers, troublemakers, divas. Yeah. And and Kevin is super nice. Yeah. Super agreeable. Yeah. No attitude. Right. You know, great work ethic. Yeah. You know, he he's he's safe. Yes. He's very safe. Yes. And then everybody ain't safe. Mm -hmm. And you know, I I think uh, how did Patrice coin this? Hollywood would rather have somebody who's uh 30% talent, 70% nice guy, than 70% talent, 30% asshole. I agree. I mean, I'm the same way in my business. Right. When you look at my regular guests, and I have a lot of them now, these are all people that I get along with. I don't argue with them. When we agree on a time, they show up. They're professional, you know? If there's payment involved, they don't start threatening my payment person because the money didn't come that day, right. which has happened before with some of my previous repeat guests that are no longer repeat guests. Right. You ultimately have to work within a system that's involving a lot of other people. If you're the diva, if you're showing up whenever you feel like it, you're not going along with what everyone agreed on and so forth, you have a problem. You know what I'm saying? Like, if you're Suge Knight and you're sitting there acting a fool, eventually you will be blacklisted from everyone you want to work with and possibly even end up in jail. Yeah. This is the reality of business. You know, yes, people have, you know, people are human, people have desires, whatever else, but everyone ultimately just wants to make their money, have a pleasant environment and go on with their life. You know, one of my favorite clips was when uh, Kevin and Tiffany were on The Breakfast Club and Kevin goes on this rant and he goes, the problem I have with Kat is that Kat, you were the one that fucked up your position. At what point, you were the guy. You were the dude. But you were the one that fucked off your press tours, didn't show up, came up late. You were the one doing drugs and tripping and acting like so-and-so and so-and-so. So it's like, instead of you pointing all your fingers saying, it's this person, it's that person, take accountability. Yeah. Take responsibility. Facts. And, 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 and again, I love my people, but one thing about us as a community, we don't like to be held accountable. And when you hold us accountable, especially when the when the person holding us accountable looks like us, oh, that's blasphemous. That's almost just total disrespect. And there are some things within our community that we should absolutely be held accountable with. Absolutely. You know, and talking about being held accountable, I'm gonna hold myself accountable because and, and it's so funny because when I sent the post out, I addressed this. I purposely made sure that I pointed this out. And this is why I go, I believe most people walking the earth are just fucking stupid because they don't pay attention. They, they, they The details are there. And I knew people were gonna say, well, Aries, that's like the kettle calling, the, the pot calling the kettle black. You know how many times I've seen you on interviews where you've said X, Y, Z about certain people? And yes, I have. And I am as guilty as charged but I'm also trying to grow up because at the end of the day, I'm tired of being a 45 year old, 15 year old. How much longer can I do that? <laughs> at some point you gotta grow the fuck up. Uh. And it's like, if it's not gonna move the needle, if it's not gonna make my life better, if it's not gonna impact the people's lives that I'm talking about, what's the point? So and I understand black people wanna go, well, he stood in his truth. All right, great, he stood in his truth. But at the end of the day, what did it change? And I, and I, and I hate to keep, beating that same drum, but my my biggest thing is, again, I'm holding myself accountable. I've said things about people that I've regretted, and then I've said things that I maybe not have regretted. I just shouldn't have said it, though, because if it doesn't make a difference, what's the point? Well, uh, to Ray Hart, uh, Kevin Hart's ex-wife announced that she's going on tour with Cat Williams. I mean, listen, I thought the classiest thing I saw was when they... Uh, I think it was TMZ caught Kevin in New York and they asked him about it. And he said, I hope it's a successful tour. Yeah. You know, that's what I'm saying. That's why niggas love that motherfucker. <laughs> he is the Capri Sun of comedy. <laughs> <laughs> Who don't like a good Capri Sun, even if you're in your 50s? I'm like Hennessy, nigga, straight. But, and again, I don't say that as a diss. It's a joke. Mm. But, you know, Kevin's very likable and agreeable, man. He yeah. takes everything with a grain of salt.
yeah, he don't really beef with anyone. Um, you know, he's a man, so he got caught up in a few things here and there, but nothing so egregious that he's getting arrested for it or, you know, he's losing movie roles or, you know, whatever else. I mean, listen, at, at some point, this, this is what people don't realize. Like when it comes to business, at some point you have enough money where you work with the people you like to work with and you don't talk to the people who you don't like to work with. It's just that simple. When you look at all these clicks and everything else like that, you could put some sort of devious Illuminati thing behind them, but a lot of times just groups of friends. You know, my regular guests are people who I actually like. Me and Michael J. White are actually friends. He lives down the street. He goes to my house sometimes. We have lunch. Like, that's my man. I call him up. I ask him for advice, vice versa. Like, these are people that I like and we make money together. TK, that's my man. Like, we like each other and we make money together and we rinse and repeat. You know, I've had people I've had problems with and I'm like, I don't care how much money this will bring. This will be a headache. Right. And I know it'll be a headache. So fuck them. Right. You know, maybe at some point we all mature or whatever else. Like, or maybe we won't. Life goes on. Right. Well, one of the things that Kat also talked about was the whole putting on a dress thing. Yeah. He claimed that Martin Lawrence called him up and said, hey, I got a buddy movie for you. I want you to come in and read these parts, whatever else. He showed up and it was Big Mama's House Part 2 and he was supposed to wear a dress. And he ran away out of there. Mm. Now, you yourself, you've worn dresses before, right? And, you know, when the whole Cat Williams thing came out, everyone was tagging me with that one uh, little spoof music video he did with the guy where you guys were like kissing on each other and stuff like that. Yeah. I'm sure that's come up in your DMs recently as well. Yeah. Let me tell you something. And now I definitely won't look to the camera. To all you guys that keep sending me that clip, I don't know why you think that affects me. I don't know. I don't know why you think I lose sleep at night over that. These guys send me this clip like somehow it's a gotcha moment because now we got the internet. Everybody's a sleuth slash detective. They can dig shit up and they're going, yo, man, what about this shit here? You kissing the dude? This is what Kat was talking about. Yo, what's up with this? Explain yourself. I'm, I'm a 48 year old man. I don't have to explain myself to nobody, but since I'm going to address it, let me address it. I know who I am and I know who I'm not. I know what I am and I know what I'm not. I know what I like and I know what I don't like. And at the end of the day, I'm doing a comedy skit with a spoof based on something that we know exists in hip hop. It wasn't like, you know, I'm, I, I'm simulate fucking the motherfucker or he's fucking me. It was a quick, Mwah. that make me gay? That make me all kinds of fucked up? I, I'm less of a man? Listen, man, the black community, community has always been overly homophobic and, and conservative. At the end of the day, it's fact versus fiction. It don't mean shit to me. It don't bother me. I know who I am. I'm securing my own manhood and sexuality. It don't mean nothing to me. So send them all. I don't give a fuck. I really don't. Yeah, I mean, men in general are overly homophobic. And I've talked about this recently where if I see, you know, one of my guests come in, especially if they're a little bit older, and I see that they're in shape, I'll be like, yo, man, you look great. Like, I'll say it on camera. Yo, you look great. You've been working out? Like, yo, congratulations. In general, men don't like saying that because it made them sound right, gay. Let me, let me I'm point, not saying you look I, handsome. I, know, I want to get me, with you. It's like, yo, you're let looking good. Let me, let me point something out to you. And this is one of these times where you and I have to have a little bit where we get into race debates. Okay. Because you are like my podcast partner, Andy Steinberg, where you and him have Larry Bird-like energy where it's like you know you hang around niggas you can play like niggas but you seem to think that because you can do that that that's the majority of most white people and what i'm saying to you is this i agree with you to an extent from a straight up male machismo thing yeah m most men are ugh, when it comes to that but if there are two races of people and one is more ugh, than the other is is black people and i'm knowing this based off facts, a joke I do. I do a joke about getting a prostate exam. 
And at the end of the joke, I, I, I call out the elephant in the room. I go, you know, it's funny when I tell that joke. I, I look at all the black dudes. Y'all wanted to laugh, but you fought it. Because black people, particularly black men, were very homophobic. We don't fuck around when it comes to our sexuality. And then I finish the joke by going, you know, white boys don't have a problem laughing at that because white boys play gay games with each other all the time. Tanner, Trevor, Ethan, sleep. Put your balls on his nose and take a picture. And the audience falls out. Why? It's true. I've seen more white do it. You can look at MTV's ridiculousness. And there is clip after clip of white boys putting a dick on their man's face, farting in their face with powder coming out their ass, all kinds of semi-gay shit. And black guys don't swim in those waters. We just don't. Although, I'm sure that homosexuality and bisexuality in the black community is probably the same as it is in every other community. In terms of? I'm sure there's as many, percentage-wise, as many gay men. I won't dispute you on that. As there's white. I won't you dispute know, you on that. White gay men. But what I'm telling you, as far as straight men go, black men don't play them games. Dave even had a joke about it on his uh, Showtime special for what it's worth. He goes, yeah, you can't fall asleep around your white friends because they'll do shit like, hey, so-and-so sleep. Let's put a carrot in his ass. Yeah, I don't but, do that. But you don't. At you all. don't. At all. You don't, but you're not the majority, though. Okay, but I'm saying... What I'm saying is if you showed up here and you had lost 20 pounds, I'd be like, yo, you look great. Congrats. Okay. I work out too. You know, I work out every morning. I hit the treadmill for hour, hour and a half. I understand how hard it is to lose weight, you know, in terms of not only working out, but eating right and, you know, having self-control and everything else like that. If I lost weight, I'd want someone else to notice. People notice when I start losing weight. A lot of men were like, yo, you lost some weight. Yo. Let me tell you something on my podcast. Black men mostly actually have told on me On my that. podcast, when Andy and I have talked about, we often talk about movies and movie stars. And one of the things that came up was we go, when you look at certain actors, are they a movie star or are they a great actor or both? So when we got to talking about certain people, yo, I would say, yo, I understand the, the magnitude of why Denzel was where he was. Or, or where he is. Same thing with Brad Pitt, George Clooney. And I'll go, talented, good looking, sexy, and when you read the comments, Pauls. Pauls. Yeah, I, would, I wouldn't call another man sexy. That's where I would draw the line. Well, well, you're pointing out the obvious. I, I, would Denzel, say, I, Denzel, I would say good looking, but the term sexy means that I'm somehow sexually. No, it doesn't. It, listen, you got eyes. You got eyes. When, when, when women go crazy over Shamar Moore or Boris Kojo, why do you think that is? Because they're not sexy? They have sex appeal. Yeah, they're just, handsome. Just not to me. Well, that's your weird hang up. That's a weird hang up? That's a weird hang up because what's, you're pointing out what's obvious. Look, what, what, I, do you I, not... I, I can look at an incredible, like, like a, you know, like a horse, like, you know, like an actual horse racing horse. And I can say, yo, that's a beautiful horse. The muscle tone and everything is incredible. But I wouldn't call that horse sexy. But I'm sure that other horses might find that horse sexy. The, the fact that you just said what you said is that white bestiality. <laughs> That's that shit y'all be into. Y'all weirdos, man. All I'm saying is that you could say Vlad, that something me, is... Me, me recognize, something looks good me, doesn't mean I want to have sex with that thing. Exactly. So yeah. me recognizing Denzel in it... When Denzel so was, you think Denzel's on, sexy? Denzel, Do you think Denzel's sexy? I'm about to answer you. Okay. Denzel and Mo Better Blues, when Denzel was at the apex of his Denzel Washingtonness, his prime... Same thing with Brad Pitt. Yeah, they're sexy guys. You can see why women would be drawn to that. Mm. Does that mean I want to fuck them? No. But I'm recognizing what's obvious. When yeah, I was I in know. my 20s, y'all, I was a sexy motherfucker, man. <laughs> sexy, nigga. I remember I pulled up that old picture of you back in the day. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to get back. I'm going to get back to it. That way, when I see you, when I'm that, you can tell me how sexy I am. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you you're sexy. I'm going to say you look good, though. I would say you look good. I mean, the, the, the whole hang up about dresses in Hollywood. And what's interesting is, you know, listen, when it comes to internet, nothing ever dies. Dave Chappelle had this whole interview with Oprah where he was talking about how when he was filming Blue Streak yeah. with Martin Lawrence, the director showed up with a dress and said, hey, I want you to wear this dress. It'd be really funny. And Dave Chappelle's like, I'm not comfortable doing that. I'm not gonna wear a dress. Lo and behold, there's an old Howard Stern skit 
where he's dressed like a woman. We'll go he's back. got we'll, he's got we'll, titties. We'll, okay, he's got big earrings. He's got lipstick. And there's also him in a dress in Robin Hood, Men in Tights. Oh, right. Was so, that a, was it? Yeah, yes. that was a dress. So, oh, so, so, yeah. so again, when all these people on the in the on the internet and in the comments section going, yeah. That's why we hold Dave Chappelle to this high esteem. I, he ain't never wore a dress. Yeah, your hero did too. Yeah. And and and, and let me point out something. And, and I said this in a recent interview. Two words. Balance and perspective. Black people, for the love of God, let's have balance and perspective. First of all, men in drag has been an old comedy staple since comedy. And Milton Berle has done it. Tom Hanks and Bosom Buddies. Uh, uh, D Dustin Hoffman won an Oscar for it in Tootsie. Yep. Fucking uh, Robin Williams destroyed it at Mrs. Doubtfire. And I'm and I'm taking a little bit of what Marlon Wayans said because he did an interview with Big Boy. Yeah. And he said, you, uh, he goes, how do you feel about women in dresses and what Kat said? He said, you talking to a man that was in a dress. And he goes, why is it that black people have been brainwashed to believe that somehow if we're artists, and this is what this is, comedy, acting, it's an art. Yeah. So why can't we have the same ability to demonstrate ourselves artistically and our form of artistic expression comedically, however we see fit, without being judged for it, without being labeled as, you know, oh, uh, it's demeaning to black men. And again, when you look at all the prominent black actors that exist, comedically, that's a comedy thing. But you look at Denzel, Morgan Freeman, Wesley Snipes, Ving Rhames, Anthony Mackie. I could go on and on and on when he was alive. Chadwick Boseman. Those guys are dramatic actors. Well, but some of them wore dresses. Well, Wesley Snipes and, Wesley and, Snipes and Ving Rhames. We've had more of our prominent black male actors in performances out of dresses than in dresses. That has been primarily a comedic staple. Yeah. And we've played everything from lawyers to doctors to politicians to judges to cops to superheroes, loving fathers, loving husbands, everything across the board, far more than we've seen black men in dresses. So if the scales of balance have more of our black men in roles that are uplifting, stick your, chin at your chest out, hold your chin up, you know, not degrading, not demeaning, positive black imagery, then you know what? It's okay to have a little bit of that there for comedic purposes. That's okay. And my thing is this, if you're really that hard on your stance about black men in dresses, so you mean to tell me we now are going to devalue Eddie Murphy, one of the most iconic, beloved yep. superstars the in crumps. comedy. The Crumps. Crumps, yep. Norbit as Rasputiats. Mm, yep. We're going to put an asterisk near Richard Pryor, the greatest comedian of all time, because he dressed up as a maid in the toy. Jamie Foxx, the triple threat. Oscar winner, dramatic actor, comedian, singer. You loved him as Wanda and in Living Color. Yeah. So now, he, now, Wanda, now yeah. he, his, his status is diminished. You ain't gonna see none of these people perform if they come live to your city. Martin Lawrence, the Ma and Show. Yeah. One of the most beloved TV shows in the black community. Shanene. Shanene, Mama Payne, the Clumps, the uh, Big Mama's House franchise. Yep. So now all of a sudden, we don't have respect for Martin. You ain't coming to see Martin if you perform live in your city. Marlon and Sean Wayans, white chicks. Mm. Flip Wilson, Geraldine was iconic because for that time, no black people had their own shows. He was one of the first black entertainers to have his own show which gave a platform to other black comedians to come on. He created an iconic character in Geraldine. So you mean to tell me all these black comics beloved, we've lost respect for them. They're less than men in our eyes and in our community. You wouldn't come see them perform live. You're a liar. You're lying. Well, I was actually going to ask you this because me and Tony Yeo got into this big argument, uh, you know, on camera about this. You mentioned Richard Pryor, the toy. Yeah. I thought that movie was kind of late. It was. And I felt that it, it was kind of- his greatest work. I, I felt like it was kind of a demeaning role. A rich white kid owns essentially like a middle-aged black man. You know what I'm saying? And Tony goes, oh, that's stupid. That was a great movie. You know, Richard Pryor well, it. wasn't a it. great movie. Yeah. But, but also it was a movie for its time. I'm watching old Richard Pryor movie, Toy, because I feel like- That shit was horrible. I feel, 
You fucking the toy. You fucking. You thought dumb. that was a great film? You shut the fuck up. You, you yo, for idiot, real. Bro. You thought the toy. You don't know nothing, Vlad. A white kid with a black man as his it personal does, it pet. It didn't matter. It, it, it's Richard Pryor was a funny motherfucker, and he, he, and you, you didn't see the lesson. He taught that kid how to be more responsible and more smart. Yeah. He, it was somebody from the hood with a rich white kid. He got paid. That movie would not run today. There's no way they could make I'm that movie. I'm still watching Toy. <laughs> any There's movie, no listen, way in 2022 listen, they would make a movie like any that. Any movie, I'm an 80s, going, going into the 80s, 78, I was born, going to the 80s, to 90s, baby. So G.I. Joe, he met Richard Pryor, Eddie, Eddie Murphy, anything that has to do with the 80s, I fuck with. Nah, I feel you. I'm a Richard Pryor fan. That Toy movie, though, is nah, a fucking I'm, I'm classic. not fucking with it. You Yo, think Toy's a classic? I think so. Bruce you think so? Bruce, Bruce and Millions was a classic, ah. too. Toy was a classic. He was in a mansion. They was playing around. Yeah. The little kid loved Richard Pryor at the end. He, matter of fact, it was a lesson. It was like showing you, yo, the, the father had all the money. He had all that shit. Richard Pryor didn't have no money. The kid was lonely. So you could have all this money, but your kid won't be happy. He want to spend time. Richard Pryor spent time. It was a meaning in the movie, right? You're just seeing white man, black man. No, because I don't see color. You, you know, you're still coming off, coming from a time when, you know, those racial tropes and stereotypes were extremely powerful. I mean, would you feel that was a demeaning role? No. No. I didn't think it was. Okay. Did he do anything demeaning in it? I thought the whole premise of it was somewhat demeaning. The whole premise overall. Well, you could argue that all day. Would you but take a role like that right now? If someone gave you a role, said, listen, you're going to be... If the context in it, the context, whatever the premise is, is the premise. The context in it, am I doing something demeaning? Am I doing something to embarrass myself and my race? You're going to be a toy to a rich white kid. And it's going to be called the toy. Depends you are a toy to a how funny, You're a grown man, a grown on how black man the movie who's is. a toy to depends a rich white kid. Depends on how funny kid. the movie is. Okay. How good the movie so is. So you might do it. Maybe. Maybe. It depends okay, on the that's fair. You're being fair. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. Well, uh, the Dave Chappelle comedy special. It dropped on New Year's Eve. You actually commented on it on your podcast. Uh -huh. What did you think overall? It didn't blow me away. Yeah. The way my favorite David Chappelle special, uh, besides Killing Him Softly, is Equanimity. Uh, Which one is that? That's the one where he wore, wore the uh, gray denim. It's like a jean jacket with the C on the chest. He he ended the the the, the, the uh, special where he talked about and I kicked her in the pussy. Okay, yeah, I remember that. Yeah, that to me is is of all his specials the best. And then Killing Me Softly. Uh, the only ones that I didn't, I wasn't crazy about was Bird's Eye Revelation, which he did in the belly room, uh, the comedy store, and this one. You know, uh, they just didn't jump out at me as powerful as the other ones did. Yeah, I mean, he was somewhat edgy. Yeah. Then he went off on Lil Nas X yeah. with that whole thing. I didn't walk away saying, wow, that was that was great. I didn't either. Yeah, I thought, okay. I mean, I'm glad I watched it. I'm yeah. a Dave Chappelle fan. Yeah. But, you yeah, know, okay. It was cool. It was cool. Didn't blow me away. Right. But, you know, obviously he's got a great situation with Netflix. I'm sure they gave him a huge bag of money. Listen, man, Dave on his worst day is better than some of the best dudes on their best day. Dave is our generation's Richard Pryor, period. I agree. Period, man. Yeah, I mean, he's the biggest working stand-up comedian in America right now. Well, I mean, I, I think one would argue that Kevin Hart is, you know, as hard as he works and selling out arenas. Okay, so you would say if Dave Chappelle and Kevin Hart had a show across the street from each other, more people would go to the Kevin Hart show than the Dave Chappelle Dude, show? I, I, I would say I, it's Chappelle. I, I don't think that's as easy as you think it is. I, I might be wrong. I'm just saying. From my I point of view- I could be wrong too, but what I'm saying is, Kevin's huge, man. That dude can sell out 30, 40,000 seats right. by himself. Because he also has the movie star aspect to it. He's exactly. got a big movie on Netflix exactly. right now. So there's that. Yeah, I don't know. Listen, I'm, I'm, you I'm, might be right. I'm, you might telling be right. You, I'm telling you comedically in terms of who does it for me. Kevin does not do it for me like that. 
Yeah, that's, I'm not a big Kevin Hart right. stand-up fan. I, I think he in the movies, he's a fucking scene, scene stealer. Yeah. And he kills in the movies. Yeah. But for my personal comedic taste, Dave's my guy. Now, I'm not saying that to say, speak down on Kevin, speak bad about Kevin. I'm just saying for me, Dave's my guy. I'll be honest, too. I'm not a huge fan of Kevin Hart, the actor. I think that he essentially plays one role very well, which is the self-deprecating guy, you know, the short self-deprecating, right. which is what he kind of does in a lot of his comedy specials. Right. But like when you watch this new movie on Netflix, the one about the plane, whatever, seeing him as an action star, I I'm, I'm just not buying it. I'm just not buying it. Seeing him kick people and flip people over and karate chop and- At 4'2". At, at yeah, at 4'2". It's hard, it's hard I, I mean, did you, see, did you watch the movie? You no, but, about? no, but- but 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 it's what you think it is. You're right. It's him on a plane. He's like right. a secret agent. Yeah. And he's got a team of kung fu guys and girls yeah. and he's beating yeah. people up. Yeah. And I understand why he wants to do a role like that because listen, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, action movies translate globally. Yeah, action movies translate globally, but thank God you still have to kind of look and be the part. Yeah. That's like when Ice Cube did the Vin Diesel movie. Listen. Was it Triple X? Triple X. Ice Cube is a little chunky nigga. He built like a propane tank. <laughs> action stars look like The Rock. Jason yeah. Statham. Yeah. Sl Stallone and Schwarzenegger in the 80s. In the prime, yeah. Or, or, or even if you go with a guy like Bruce Willis, Bruce Willis may not have had the necessary physique, but he was the every man's man. Hmm. The kind of gu guy you know yeah. would sit at a bar, crack open a beer, and might break it over your head if you disrespect him. Hmm. You have to look and be the part. And 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 again, no disrespect to Kevin, but this nigga's 3'8". Yeah. And it gets to a certain point where when people become so successful in Hollywood, Hollywood then goes, well, he can do anything. Well, no, you can't. You got to It's it's you know even even with the suspension of disbelief, you got to sell me a little bit. You know I know I've said this on my podcast, and I know this is gonna sound chauvinistic, but I'm being honest. I can't stand watching women in action movies. Like what was the one movie did by uh, what's her name Charlize Theron, Atomic Blonde I think it was called. It's, seeing some five nine. Dainty woman in, in a toothpick and heels, beating up big Russian dudes, throwing them through glass, flipping them on tables, breaking limbs. I don't buy it. That's the new Kevin Hart movie. There's a, there's okay. a girl in the in the movie that's doing that type of thing. Stop it. She's beating up like big. Stop it. Like army dudes and stuff Stop like that. Stop it. Yeah. If, if, if there are women that are beating niggas up like that, the easiest sell for me as a black woman. Because the average hood rat bitch will fight a nigga and might whoop your ass. <laughs> if, if, if it's a black girl, if her name ends with an Isha, I can buy that. It's a rap. It's a rap. It's a rap. Real hardcore ghetto black bitches will beat the shit out <laughs> you. But some blonde, fucking 5'9", skinny in heels, stop it. The truth of the matter is, if you smack the shit out the average white girl, she usually cries. And a black woman or what? Beat the shit out of you? Beat the shit out of you. <laughs> or at least try to. I mean, what do you think about the whole Lil Nas X thing? Because now he's got a new new song called J. Christ. You know, he he played around with the whole Jesus, Christianity thing. He had like a, the devil in his video. Where he was giving him a lap dance. and This is why I go fact versus fiction. Fiction and a comedic skit? I gave a dude a peck on the lips. Fact, that's where the buck stops for me. I'm not a little Nas X fan. Never will be, never would be. You don't like Old Town Road? I am 100% full-blooded heterosexual male. Right, but that's not a gay song. In fact, he's even talking about cheating on his girl in the song. He didn't come out of the closet when that and, song and came And Rock out. Hudson kissed women on film. But we know who he was. Right. That's not so. Wait, wait. So, so you can't. Okay, so you no, can't tell me. No, that, that, he's too, you can't. You can't enjoy music from gay artists as a straight man. You don't first like. Of all, I, you don't I, like Elton John's catalog. I'm not an Elton John fan. Okay, you don't like. Um, let me see. Who, who are the? You can bring up a thousand motherfuckers from the from the village, 
and I'm I'm not going with you. Okay, hold on, dude. That's just not that's not my style. That's not my style. That's why you don't like Queen. We are the champions. We are the champions. We will rock you. I listen. I saw the the Freddie, under pressure. I saw the Freddie Mercury movie. Right. I saw the Elton John movie. Uh huh. And they were good movies. Okay, yeah, they were cool movies, but certain aspects of that shit, I, I, you lose me. There was a scene in the in the in the Elton John movie where I guess he just finished having sex with his guy, and the guy's in the missionary position, and Elton is in the missionary position in between his legs. When I'm on I'm on the plane and I see that and I went, oh God. And I turn my 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 my, my iPad down. Mm -hmm. I, I just, listen. Oh, this this is walking through a minefield. Um, to each his own. But I can only go so far. Well, it's music. You're not visually having to see this stuff. Well, I saw a Nas X video one time where he right. was in a locker room. No, I understand. I'm not talking about videos. I'm talking about the audio. Like, you don't like Frank Ocean? I've never listened to Frank okay. Ocean. Okay. You don't like George Michael or Wham? Never listened to them. Really? Yeah. Careless Whisper, Last I Christmas. I don't even know what you're talking about. No? No. All huge songs. Okay. Mega, mega hits. Okay. Okay. All right. Well, I guess you just don't listen to gay artists. I personally do. I personally love Alan John, Freddie Mercury, uh, George Michael, Frank Ocean. These are all, these are all brilliant brilliant artist to me. Not saying they're not. Brilliant. Not saying they're not. Just not my cup of tea. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Well, uh, Boosie went to go see The Color Purple with his nine-year-old daughter, I believe, and walked out during the gay scene. It was actually a lesbian scene, like a kissing scene. Mm -hmm. And everyone got into an uproar over this. Does this shock you at all? That people got into an uproar? No. That he walked out? No. Yeah. Listen, man. You have kids. Yes. I have know. you ever have you ever dealt with your kids asking you about gay imagery they see on TV or, or anything no. else like that? Mm -mm. So you never had that conversation? No. Okay. But I, it's know, not like they don't see it. Especially these days. Well, in today's generation of moisture, they live around it. Yes. Um... Listen, man, you, you know, you, you have, you should have the right to feel how you feel. As long as how you feel doesn't take away, take away anybody's rights or doesn't uh, promote violence, uh, you have the right to feel how you feel. And, you know, everybody's not comfortable with everything just because society says you should be. Mm -hmm. You know, it's the reason why I'm telling you with Lil Nas X. I've seen certain things that he's done and it, it's it doesn't make me comfortable. So for me to invest in him musically, I can't do that because I know who he is and what he's done, and and that's not my vibe. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, listen, it's not my vibe. I, I like certain Lil Nas X songs. I don't really watch the videos. I don't really need to see a whole bunch of gay imagery. That's just not my thing. You know, in the same way that. You know, you reacted to like a, a gay scene in a movie, seeing two men kiss, I usually just look away or I just put my hand in front of the screen because it's some oh, sort funny. of, yeah, just the hand. You know what I'm talking about? The hand. Okay. You don't be trying to peek through your fingers? No. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh, wait, I'm still seeing a little bit. No, no, it's just not my thing. And it, it makes me feel a little uncomfortable seeing it. If that makes me homophobic, then I guess I'm homophobic. I'm, but, but see, I'm 15 and that, years old. And that's always been my argument. I, I'm okay with that. But it doesn't. That. And it shouldn't. You should be, you, you should, if, if you should have the right to your feelings. Yeah. It'd be one thing if you looking at a gay scene on your laptop, you put your hand up like this, you look through your fingers, see something you don't like, you yeah, take a laptop know. and smash a gay man in the face. Now we're talking about something different. Right. But as long as you're not inflicting violence, and you're not taking away anyone, away anybody's rights. What's, you feel how you feel. I know that some men and women don't like seeing interracial love scenes. And that's that just is what it is. Hmm. Some yeah, people feel strongly about that. 
Yeah, them is yeah, them is. Mm -mm, that's Trump supporters. <laughs> So you never had a problem with like a white man and a black woman having sex scenes, kissing scenes and stuff like I that. I would have a problem with it if while they're doing it, there's no racism between them involved. In other words, sex by itself is amazing. If you sprinkle a little racism on top of that, that shit's explosive. Explosive. Yes. Uh, explain. I got to hear this. If I got a white, if I'm with a white woman, I have to take advantage of the fact that she's white. Okay. I want us to play the race card sexually. <laughs> okay. I'm the escaped slave and that's Massa's wife. And she has to go along with that. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I actually have a couple jokes about, about that. That's uh, okay, so you mean to tell, hilarious. okay, so hold on, hold on. Okay, since you want to go here, have you ever had a white girl, have you ever asked a white girl to call you the N-word in bed? No, never. But you want her to refer to you as an escaped slave in bed. Yes, because at the end of the day, I'm fucking her. And I'm saying, so I'm getting even. The N word, that feels a little too personal. Okay. That's that feels like an attack. Okay. So what would she say? She our safe word would be watermelon. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> but what what would she say to you in this role playing? Whatever you call it, situation. Uh, You've clearly done this before. You are not making this up. No, no, I, I actually am making some of it up. But but again, I, I have three jokes that I do about role playing sexually with different races, and I you know I, I wish I could do them, but they're 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 lengthy. Um, but I have one where I go uh, to, to if I see an, an Asian woman with a whatever the color the man is, white, black, whatever, uh, particularly black. I go, uh, dog, you don't racially, sexually mix it up with her? And the guy will go, no. I go, yeah, if you was my girl, I would sexually, racially role play. I come home from work one day in a soldier's outfit, right? And the audience starts doing what you're doing. Okay. And I go, uh, hold on, it gets worse. <laughs> and it I gets come worse. in and I got my dick hanging out the zipper. And I'm, I'm holding it like it's a machete. And I'm like, I'm an American soldier here to slay some. And then I ask the Asian girl, what, what's your nationality? She go Filipino. I go Filipino. Shit, it works better for the joke if you're Vietnamese. Fuck it, you're Vietnamese. I'm an American soldier here to slay some Vietnamese ass, uh, and I can't see you. You're hidden somewhere in the house, but you got like a potato sack on from stress <laughs> and a little dirt and dried grass on your face, and I just hear you yell out from a distance. You go home, black man. It's not you war. <laughs> Come on, man. Uh, yeah, my sex life feels very boring right now. Yeah, and then and then <laughs> once the joke's over, you know, I, I go, you guys are laughing, but her husband's like, that's not that's a bad not, idea. Not, not funny. Yeah. yeah. So, so I mean, you have fun with it. Yeah. Well, uh, Taraji P Henson. Yeah. Uh, I've gotten a lot of flack for some of my comments. Have those hit your radar? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, well, you said because of what she said, and then you said something. I said a few things. Has it hit your radar yet? This became a whole- the, the flack or what she was talking about? Well, what I said. Well, it was both. I mean, she got flack for what she said and I responded and I got flack for what I this said. This hasn't hit my radar. Has it hit your radar. Okay, so so here's, here's what happened. She did the whole interview where she was crying, talking about how she gets underpaid and um, her movies, you know, she's always told that her movies don't translate and she has to she works so much because she doesn't get paid what she, you know, what she would like and she has to work more and so forth and she was in tears and so forth. So I chimed in on this in a few different interviews. Uh, me and Lunell talked about it. Me and Math Hoffa talked about it. The one with Math Hoffa started to go kind of viral. And what I said was this. My overall explanation of it was this. Number one, I'm a big Taraji fan. All her movies, I feel she's killed it. I feel she's a top tier actress. Everything she's done has been exquisite. I don't remember a bad Taraji P. Henson performance in any of the movies. And I've seen pretty much all her movies. But what I said was this. At the level that Taraji is at, with the amount of years she put in into Hollywood, if she feels that she's not being compensated, what she feels she deserves in Hollywood it's time to start your own production company and it's time to start putting your own films together. And maybe you don't have the skills to write, direct, whatever else, but you could partner 
with the most talented people and you could get, based on your relationships, the most talented people to work with you. And at that point, you pay yourself whatever the movie makes. And you call flack for that? Well, I also made a couple other comments, which I actually apologize. Because here's the... I, no, hold on, hold on. Which, which I, I, I don't understand flack behind that. I agree with you. Yeah. And what I call flack for, which I actually apologized for, me and Michael J. White just did an interview and, and the apology is now going viral as well. What I said, which I felt was a little below the belt, was that she's worth $12 million and lives in a $6 million house. And the average person doesn't want to hear a millionaire complain about money. And I later on said, you know something? That was kind of wrong. Uh, you know, someone close to me kind of pointed out like, that really has nothing to do with the, with the conversation. What she has is what she has. She's talking about what she makes. So I said, you know something? I'm sorry about that. And I also want to apologize for what I said in terms of she has a $12 million net worth and she lives in a $6 million mm -hmm. house. And, you know, and I said that, you know, most working people don't want to hear rich people complain that they mm -hmm. didn't get an extra few million. Right, yeah, yeah. You know, this is coming from something I've dealt with myself. Absolutely, no one wants to hear absolutely. me complain about I didn't get the money I felt I deserved. Mm -hmm. But that was a cheap shot. You know, someone close to me pointed that out recently. And mm -hmm. I, I apologize to Taraji for saying that. But overall, my point is Hollywood is never going to pay you what you feel you deserve. But when you look at all the successful people in Hollywood, the majority of them started their own productions and started their own projects. They still will take roles here and there, but you know, you compare it to like a Reese Witherspoon. Reese Witherspoon has a huge production company and a lot of these big films that she's in, she's producing them as well. And that was my point. I, I really don't understand what you caught the flag for uh, because- well, I, you know, a, a white man shouldn't well, even be that, allowed yeah, to yeah, talk about yeah, black I women. I know, I know, and that's I get that. That's sometimes when 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 uh, I, I'm gonna catch flack for saying what I'm about to say. This is what I mean when I say black people don't like to be held accountable because that to me is a go to. Well, because you're white, you shouldn't fuck out of here. Facts are facts. Yeah. So let's lose the race issue on that. And you know, I'm one of the first people to point out with you about when you <laughs> playing right. the white man. Oh no, no, you go hard. White you go dance. hard at me. Yeah. Um, and this is what I meant when I was talking about the Cat Williams thing, where we're all ooing and on over a fucking news cycle. We got one of our best black female artists crying about the fact that her and her uh uh what's that word? Co-stars? Not co-stars, but people that, my comrades, my, my, there's a, there's a better word for it, but her constituents, they're all not getting paid what they should get paid. And listen, I saw recently where Sharon Stone did an interview and talked about how she was underpaid. Exactly. But there's a pecking order. However many women, white women complain about being underpaid, black women are under that. Mm -hmm. So yes, are women getting screwed by the male Hollywood system, black and white? Yes. But are black women more so screwed over than white women? You better believe it. So again, when I'm going, instead of Kat using this platform to, to, to rouse niggas up and go, oh, Kat said, oh, why, why don't we use our powers to form like the Avengers and make it so that Taraji don't have to cry? Make it so that Viola Davis don't have to complain. Mm -hmm. Make it so that we we create our own shit so that we don't need them to do for us when we can do for ourselves. And the fact that I caught flat, that message was so over niggas' heads. They don't want to hear that. It's much easier to revel in the bullshit. Yeah. It's much more, more fun to play in the gossip. Yeah, that nigga, protect him at all costs. He, he stood on his truth. Listen, to all you guys saying that, does Cat pay your rent? Nope. Does he feed your kids? Nope. Is he making your life better? Nope. So what do you, y'all got this nigga's name on your back like a jersey, and he does nothing to improve your life. His truth does not improve your life. But like I said, if we come together, create our own Black Hollywood, our own dream works, and then use the success from that money, and funnel that wealth back into our communities to build up our communities. Now we we doing us to benefit us. Well, I mean, the reason why I brought Michael Jai White to talk about this was because, as someone that's been in Hollywood, I believe longer than Taraji, you know, who was told he to, is underpaid. He was told to his face. We talked about this in the interview. A Hollywood executive, a big executive, told him, 
You know something? You could be as big as Tom Cruise if you weren't black. He was told that. Right. So what did he do? Start making his own movies. Of course, man, you know, when a man is telling me you could be Tom Cruise, but too bad you're black, and they have this belief that, you know, you don't, you unfortunately don't sell overseas. Bullshit. Action always sold overseas. True. You know, uh, Outlaw Johnny Black, produced, written, and directed by Michael Jai White. He pulled up in a brand new, in a brand new Range Rover. Like, you know, and I asked him, I wow. said, and you got to understand that Michael has done Batman. Spawn. You know, Spawn. Yeah. Uh, you know, a bunch of Tyler Perry. Like, he's got like literally hundreds of credits. It's not like you, oh, this was some bum ass. No, no. He is a working yeah. Hollywood actor. He's played Mike Tyson. Like, yeah. He's got a lot of blood and bone. Another one of his productions. Right. And I've asked him, I said, have you made more money doing roles for Hollywood films or doing your own projects? He goes, oh, it's not even close. My own projects. Yeah. Now, people get on me like, yo, she should just be allowed to act and get paid what she wants to get paid. Life just doesn't work but, that but way. But again, where's the real money? The real in, money in being is, a is the production. Or an owner. Is to be an owner. You mean They'll to tell let us me. play all day. Dance, nigga, dance. Yeah. Jump, nigga, jump. My yeah, whole but, point but was, Taraji, you should be an owner at this point. What are you, like, she's close to 50 years old? How old is Taraji? Listen, I saw where someone was pointed out that when she co-starred. She is 53 years old. Right. At this point in your career, it's time for you to transition from just being an actress to being an actress and a producer. Right. Or an actress and an owner. Uh, you know, something of that sort. And then you can't complain how much you got paid because it's your own project. You know, and like people point out, which I think is a fair criticism, when she did Benjamin Button at 150000 150000 in a $150 million budget. And she damn near was co-star. She was the fifth lead on there. Oh. We actually looked it up. See, and th that, that's that's why I brought Michael in, Michael Jai White in, because he actually understands this. He goes, well, she's a fifth lead. And, you know, she asked for 500000 for that role, and they said, all we got is one hundred and fifty. dollars All we got. All we got. That's what they said. Right. $150,000, take it or leave it. She turned around and got an Academy Award nomination off her role. She killed it. But what he's explaining was like, look, you don't know when you're just in pre-production, whether this person is going to kill the role. You just know there's a role. Okay, we feel this is the right role. This is our budget. If you take it, cool. If not, there's 10 other people that we're going to hit up as backups. We would like you, but this is all we got. Hey, it worked out well. You got 150000 You got an Academy Award nomination. That will open you up to more opportunities, right? In theory. In theory. It definitely gives you eyeballs on you. And from there, you could go where you want to go. And what I pointed out is that a lot of people like to look at situations like this where, okay, well, she only got paid $150,000 and the movie made like a billion dollars. You know what I'm saying? They never gave her anything extra on top of that, and that's foul. But the reality of it is when you look at business, people a lot of times will look at a project that ends up blowing up and the fee they got wasn't what they felt was fair compared to how well it does later on. But when projects flop, no one ever tries to give part of their money back. That's, that's your problem. Oh, you didn't, you didn't promote it right. I did my job. But you want more money when it does well, but no one ever wants to give money back when things go bad. And as someone who does video production, I'm very aware of that. We've had guests and we've given them a big check and we've lost money. And I just got to hold that. I'm not going to call a person up and say, hey, man, listen, I didn't get the views out hoping. Can you give back to me five, ten thousand? No. Right. I hold it. I hold it. And my whole thing with Taraji, I'm hoping that these types of conversations get to her to be like, you know something? Vlad might be right. Yo, my next film, I'm going to actually be a producer. Because she got paid 500000 from Tyler Perry when she starred in, uh, in that one Tyler Perry film. And that's great. Do Tyler Perry films. If that's where you're being appreciated and they're cutting you the big checks, fuck all these other productions. You know, fuck, fuck Universal, fuck Sony. Yo, I'm going to fuck with this guy who's got his own money, who's got his own studio. He's going to pay me what I feel 
I would like to get paid. Maybe even get some ownership of it. You know, I could be a partner in the film. Why not not even take? Because a lot of times you get the option not, not to even take a salary and say, listen, just give me a piece of the film. That happens as well. But people like to point a certain type of way, and, I, and I'm always going to be the bad guy in these situations. How incredible would it be to have a Tyler Perry produced movie with all the comedians Cat talked about mm. if they all came together? Incredible. And in the sake, in the namesake of comedy, yeah. creativity, black power. Black creativity, black thought. You mean like uh, the ne last Friday, <laughs> the next the, the next Friday movie, something like that. Better than that. Better than that. Better than that. Why not? I, I'm, I, but but now that can't happen. Why? Because of that bullshit. It could happen. Well, we we hope it could happen. But what's the likelihood when we talk about egos again? We talk about men, machoism. Man, you think I'm gonna do a movie with this motherfucker? He said this. He embarrassed me in front of the world because he said that. Yeah. The internet exploding. Yeah, people get over shit, though. People, you'd like to think so, shit. Brad. You'd Not like everyone. to think so. Not everyone. But when there's a big enough check, people get over shit. Well, easier said than done. When there's done. a big enough check. E easier said than done. Well, for example, The Color Purple, uh, she did an interview about that. And she said they gave us rental cars. And I was like, I can't drive myself you know, to set in Atlanta. There's an insurance liability. It's dangerous. Now they rob people. What do I look like? Taking myself to work by myself in a rental car. So I was like, I get a driver and security to take me. I'm not asking for the moon. They're like, well, if you do that for you, I'll have to do it for everyone. She's like, well, do it for everyone. She's right. It's stuff like that that you shouldn't have to fight She's for. She's right. And the insurance argument is, is, is the biggest argument because she's absolutely right. If she gets into a car accident and gets hurt or hurt somebody else, oh, that's, and she's who she is? Yeah, yeah. She's absolutely right. I, I get it. Should she ask for that? During the negotiation process? That shouldn't process. even be an ask. The studio should want to make sure, protect your investment. I don't, I don't disagree with it. I don't disagree with it. But when you take a step back and you look at what happened in that movie, $100 million budget is made $60 million in the box office. This movie is probably going to lose tens of millions of but dollars. They, but like you just said, you don't know that going in. You don't know that. You don't know that. And because you don't know that, that's supposed to mean you're not supposed to do the right thing? I'm not saying that this wasn't the right thing to do. At the end of the day, yeah, get cars for everyone. I get it. But a lot of this stuff could be worked out in the contract ahead of time. As well, opposed it's to, supposed to. As opposed to, okay, now we're in production and now that, I'm going to do an that's, interview. That's, that's, that's your agent's job. That's your agent's job. Yeah. You know, it's all in a negotiation. People like to look at this from the outside. People who haven't but been in Hollywood. But you know what Hollywood. else we do? We, we, and this is why I think it's so important, and I alluded to this before. This is why it's so important we stop just being players and start being owners. Because when you're a player, you, there's a fear that exists within us. If we don't do what we supposed, if we don't do what we supposed to do, I might get fired. I won't get hired again. I got to eat, sir. So we, it's a mentality where we almost like slaves. We're so worried about that check because, you know, listen, even when you don't get what you deserve, this still beats the reg a, a regular nine to five. Yeah. The, the, li the life you can live, the lifestyle it provides. That's where the millionaire comment came from. Okay. Like, so, yo, but, like, no, no, but I'm, let me address that too, though. But when you're used to eating lobster, you don't go to fish sticks. And this business feeds you lobster, even if it's on a garbage can lid. <laughs> so it's like when you're used to fucking a certain way, the fear of losing that, having that being taken away from you, is stifling. And you know, people that go, oh, you're on your soapbox, oh, boo-hoo, violins. These are regular spectators. These aren't people that live this life. I'm not a spectator though. But you're in the game. I'm in the game. So you understand the game. And not only am I in the game, I remember what opened my eyes to this whole situation. When I first started Vlad TV in 2008, at the same time I was working on my first documentary. It's called Ghost Ride the Whip. It was a documentary about the hyphy movement. We got a, a deal. Oh, I thought it was a movie about a woman on my dick. No. Ghost Ride the Whip. Yeah. Ghost Ride. Oh, the girls, the ghosts. Go oh, Ghost okay. Ride the right, Whip. I got it. Yeah, you a little yeah. slow. Okay, a little slow today. I said uh, Russian comedic yeah. sensibility. Exactly. What does he mean, Ghost Ride the <laughs> I don't Whip? don't understand. Go ahead. <laughs> I remember 
I spent months working on this film. I was in the edit bay every night. I killed myself. I put everything I had into this project. It ended up being on Netflix at one point, it ended up being on BT. It had a, you know, limited theatrical, you know, showing in Oakland. It was so I was so proud. My parents were there. All of Oakland showed up and supported. Blah blah. blah. I think I got twenty five thousand off that project, and I was the director and the producer, and I was a assistant editor, I guess. And I never saw another royalty check for the rest of my life, to this day. And I remember at that point, I said, "Fuck." all this Hollywood shit, okay? They're not gonna pay me what I feel I deserve. I'm going to create my own content. And back then I was broke. The reason why I'm behind the camera in every shoot is because I used to hold the camera and I used to edit the footage and I used to do the write-ups and I used to put it out and upload it myself. Now I have a staff to do this. But the fact that I owned everything for 15, now 16 years, put me in a financial situation that was better than most of these actors that were around during this day. So I understand firsthand. And I remember TK pointing this out in our interview is that that 150 that, uh, you know, Taraji's complaining about the 150,000 she got for that role. If she starts her own YouTube channel, she could probably make that in a month and own all the content. 150,000 on YouTube is not that hard to do, especially if you're Taraji P. Henson doing interviews or doing little short skits or movies, she can make that on her own and own everything on her, uh, you know, completely by herself. But that's a lot harder to do than to show up at a set and read a script that someone wrote for you. It's going to take more work. It's going to take some hustle. But life will change. The industry changes. Money changes. Well, you know, you just said it. More work, more yeah. hustle. Yeah, and when but there's not, bigger, bigger but, rewards. Okay, but if you're not used to doing more work, more hustle, you can't see the forest beyond the trees. Whose fault is that? Okay. Whose fault is that? All right. I'm just, I, listen, I'm agreeing with you. Yeah. I'm just saying, you know, there's a reason, man, where a lot of people remain stagnant and they stay where they are. And I'm telling you, fear is, 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 uh, it's debilitating, man. Yeah, the fear. Yeah, the fear but... of I don't. I don't want to get fired. I don't want to bite the hand that feeds me. And, and and a lot of people again, the reason why they love to catch shit was because he's their voice. Yeah. For all the people that never made it, never will, never had the guts to make it, never had the guts to try. He's their guy. You know what my fear came from? My fear came from, and this is me in the movie world. This is me in the DJ world. Was wow. I have to depend on someone to decide that they're going to hire me and give me a fair amount of money Ugh. if I want to pay my rent. Ugh. And unless I get that phone call, which I have no control over, then I'm going to be messed up. Let me tell you something. That was such a scary feeling that I knew I had to do something on my own. Let me tell you something. That's why I'm so invested, heavily invested in stocks. Mm. That's why I'm trying to get into real estate. Because mm. listen, I, I still believe in my maybe naive little mind that before my day is done and I'm in the ground, I'm still going to make it in this business on a major level. I truly believe that. But while I'm holding on to that belief, mm -hmm. I'm not going to sit here and go, the only way I'm going to eat is when they hire me. Yeah. Because listen, I, and I know the, I know my reality. I ain't being put in no movies. I ain't being given no shows. I ain't been I ain't been given no Netflix special. Hollywood don't fuck with me. For now. For now. But until they do, I'm not going to sit here hat in hand talking about, "Oh, I'm only eat if I get cast in something." Yeah. Nah, I'm I'm figuring other shit out. But the comedy clubs fuck with you. The comedy clubs fuck with me. And, yeah, and, and, heavy. And, 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 you know, again, I, I took a page out of Matt Rife's book. Mm. I, I called Matt Rife up one day because I went, nigga, you went from, I forget how many hundreds of thousands of followers he had on Instagram to millions. Mm. He went from clubs to fucking theaters. I mean, ridiculous numbers. Mm -hmm. He goes, dude, I finally hired a videographer to just come out with me on the road. Yeah. I forget, he, he told me he paid like six figures but he's made millions yeah. in return. So to what you're saying, yeah. you gotta spend money to make money. And and listen, I, I'm I'm real like stingy when it comes to, I don't wanna break bread, yo. 
But I'm sitting here looking at this shit going, yeah, dude, lose, it's the, it's the blueprint. lose yeah. your fear. Yeah. Get rid of your fear. Right, because remember, Kevin Hart was cold as hell 10 years ago. He was in no movies, he was doing small clubs, and he hit YouTube and started doing those chocolate dropper videos. And those started to go viral, and he started to know, heat up. I no, know, I remember I this. With that. I remember this era. Let me tell you something. He was hot to death. He became hot to death on YouTube. And from that, that offered different opportunities. I don't know if I agree with that. When, I, when we did Shaq's All-Star Comedy Jam, yeah. me, him, Kevin, D-Ray, Cedric, we were all in the same space. After that Shaq's All-Star Comedy Jam came... Uh, uh, how to, what's the movie with Steve Harvey? Think like a man, act like a lady or woman, whatever that okay. was. And then from the success of that movie, it was over. That movie made so much money at the box office, from there, Kevin was a movie star. Okay. Well, so maybe, I don't think maybe, YouTube had anything to do right, with so it. So maybe my timeline is wrong. I, I'm not going to say that I'm right. It, it's wrong. Okay, fair enough. Fair enough. And you know, one of the things that, uh, that Michael Jai White kind of pointed out, and this is why I have real actors on my show, was that one of the things Taraji said was, you know, they always lowball me because they say that uh, my celebrity doesn't translate overseas. And what Michael pointed out was, yes, she's right, but that's not because she's a black woman. Every dramatic actor in America doesn't translate overseas. Every comedic actor in America doesn't translate overseas. Action is the only thing that translates overseas. Nobody in France wants to hear a funny American comedian. It's not going to work. They have their own funny comedians. They have their own dramatic superstars. Now, action, that's something that works worldwide, which is what he did and he focused on. He's done extremely well with it. Action always sold overseas. True. There's on, the only reason why we know who Jackie Chan and Jet Li and, you know, Jean-Claude Van Damme is because they're from another country, but they do action. Exactly. The point is is this. Uh, as a dramatic actor, as a comedic actor, China got their own dramatic and leading actors. So Russia no one does. really translates overseas but, unless they're doing action. That's right, because mm, they say it. black movies don't trans, trans, uh, uh, translate overseas. White movies don't translate overseas. Action is the only thing that translates. It does, yeah. Action does. See, it's just, that's, the, that's the bullshit that they don't tell you. Does French action work over here? Korean action works over here. Mm. Absolutely. Look at Netflix. A bunch of big squid games. Biggest thing ever. But there's a bunch of Korean films that are now taking over. A bunch of Indian action films that are now being pushed really hard on Netflix. That are successful? Successful. You see them. A number two movie in America right now. Yes. I Absolutely. Heard nobody talk about no action movies from India popping. You never heard of Squid Games? I heard Squid Games. Okay. Yeah. Well, there you go. That proves Give the me point. more than one. There's a button. Like Name another one. Don't look at your computer. Name another <laughs> one. <laughs> I, I'm not a big fan of the genre. Okay. If you I'm not a big if, fan. Listen, if you can't name one without going to your computer, the splash ain't uh, big enough. Wait, hold on, hold on. The uh, splash no, ain't no, big no, enough. No, 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 no. Hold on, hold on. Um, the Society of Snow. I just watched that. My man, have you heard of that? Sir, no. It, it was about the plane crash. You tell the, me all the, the Argentinian about. plane crash. He never crash. heard of it. I never heard of it. Big movie. Uh, hold on. I'll, I'll keep going. Um, Parasite won an Oscar. Korean film. You heard about that? Sir? You, you never heard of Parasite? No. I, I know that's what they gave us with COVID. <laughs> Parasite. It was, it was a great film. I put all of what you're saying under the off-white umbrella. Okay. That shit you know about. Okay. Fair enough. <laughs> Actually, no, I'm not going to say fair enough because a lot of people have heard I'm it. Just, I'm just simply telling you that whatever genre a foreign film does ain't fucking with the United States in that same genre. Uh, we, we, are the NFL, of, we are the NFL of movies. I get movies. it. I get it. All right. Everything, everywhere, all at once. That won Oscars as well. You know I, heard, that? I think I heard yeah, that one. Another action film. Action movies will translate worldwide dramatic films not so much when you look at the biggest budgets the hollywood companies know that that's why so much money is put into these superhero films they're loved worldwide but if you're a dramatic actress yes you're stuck in the american space and that's it that's just the reality of it that's the reality of it 
I didn't make the rules. The rules are the rules. <laughs> I don't know. That's so, so I, I hear what you're saying, but I, I think I think some of that's a little off. All right. Well, we can agree or disagree. Did you see the Martin reunion at the Emmys? I saw the clip. Martin Lawrence is looking bad, man. They said he might have. I, 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 listen, I'm no doctor, and, and neither are any of the people on the comment section, but a lot of people were saying that that was like signs of a stroke. Well, I, I, speech, I've, been, the, I've been saying this when he was in the last Bad Boys movie. I said, Yo. yeah, I kind of saw it. Yeah, there a little I said, bit this tear. is not like I couldn't watch it. It was right. painful to watch. I'm like, this is not the Martin Lawrence that I remember. Yeah, his his overall slurring of speech and the timing of his responses are a little bit slower. Right. And he had the, a stroke right. or something at one point. Do so, we know that for sure? Is that was that? I believe. Yeah, I believe he did have a stroke at one point. Remember, there was the whole thing. He kind of was wild yeah, out on yeah, the freeway. Yeah, but, we, but I, I never I never heard if that was uh, uh clearly identified as a as a stroke matter of fact i heard heat exhaustion uh well back in 1999 he suffered an apparent heat stroke oh, okay and fell into a three-day coma oh shit during which he was placed in critical condition but 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 shortly after that he seemed fine after that well i didn't notice the speech right. slurring thing until, until you pointed it out if i saw it in Bad Boys 3 a little bit. Yeah, that's what but I'm saying. But on the Martin clip, it was really it was evident. Worse. It was worse, yeah. Yeah. It, it was worse, man. I hope I hope he's okay. I'm a, I'm a fan. I do too. I, Big I'm ups to, to, to ML, man. Uh, Umar Johnson this. did an interview where he said that uh, Eminem cannot be considered a goat because he's not of African descent. And hip hop is a black art form. So there's no way that an outsider can come into a black originated art form and become the best at anything, just like a black person couldn't go somewhere else and become the best at something that was white originated. Which, you know, a lot of people have pointed out is just simply not true. If, like, if, if, if you look if, at golf, for example. If this nigga was a person, Umar Johnson. <laughs> a white man invented basketball, didn't he? Yes, he did. Who dominates the game? Black people. Exactly. So stop it. A white person uh, invented football. Who dominates and, uh, the sport? Besides Tom Brady, it's all black dominated. Okay. And I heard a nigga out of Detroit showed him how to throw. <laughs> I mean, it actually happens. I understand that there's hot takes and everything else like that, but this is actually false. Like, I remember I, I looked it up and there's been Samoan and Hawaiian sumo wrestlers that have gotten to grandmaster status in Japan. Yeah. You know what I mean? And Japan is fairly racist to begin with. You know what I'm saying? Ooh, Especially... Don't look at the niggas. Like the niggas. <laughs> Ooh, catch the niggas. But, but the fact that they go into a purely traditional ancient art form like sumo wrestling and because, yeah. hey, they come in and they beat they beat the best guys yeah. and they become the grandmasters in this. At the end of the day, you show and prove, you show and prove. It's hard to say that Eminem is not one of the best. I think it's ridiculous to say he's not one of the best yeah he's clearly one of the best yes and when he raps with the other people who are one of the best like a jay-z he holds his own what was that song he did with jay-z renegade <laughs> and i'm a jay-z fan who do you think got that got that verse eminem yeah i agree yeah 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 yeah, yeah. um I, you know listen i think in principle Certain things that Umar Johnson says is correct or said with good intention. But I'm scared of any extremist. And he's an extremist. Yeah. You know, I saw the debate and you and I talked about it, but I saw the debate where he was on Joe Button's podcast and was arguing about dude about the fact that he was with a white woman. Yeah. So, you know, and you and I talked about that. It was one of, to me, one of my favorite Vlad moments. Um, but yeah, that's that's extreme ideology. And I just think that that's just dangerous. Right, well, he's against uh, interracial anything. Anything. Yeah, he's like, like a no snow bunnies, like an anti-sign through and stuff like that. Although, and I remember there was a video that surfaced of him essentially flirting with a white girl at the mall. Ha! Did you see that? Let me tell you something. I will believe Dr. Umar Johnson's rhetoric if... He gets a blowjob from a white woman and doesn't get erect. 
Show me footage he of a white woman. He claims his enemies are sending white girls at him to Shut try to catch him. I want to see a white he... girl drop to her knees and suck his dick. And if it does not get erect, I believe You'll him. believe him. Well, uh, Yasin Bey, a.k.a. Most Def, when talking about Drake, he said, Drake is pop. His music is compatible with oh, shopping. I saw shopping. that. Agree or disagree? Well, I'm going to tell you this. One, I'm not a Drake fan. No? No. Not at all? No. So there's not a, not a single Drake song you've ever heard that's like, oh, that's kind of There high. might be a time I hear him do a chorus, and because of the melody and the flow of the song, yeah. I kind of am like... Started from the bottom, now we're here. Now oh, we're that's here. not... That don't do nothing. God, God's that, plan. That, that, that no, nothing. No, no, nothing. No, no, okay, no. all right. I mean, everybody's but, got their own taste. But, but again, Drake is from this generation. Most Def is from my generation. Right. And as far as an MC goes, most, most Def is... Yeah, he's dope. He's dope. Yeah. So when he says that, I went down. But, you know, it's most deaf, man. I'm going to roll with the sauce. I would say, and people are going to get on me for this, but well, fuck it. I'm going to say it. Well, if you look at an overall body of work, I would say that Drake is generally as lyrical as most deaf. I don't think there's a huge difference in lyricism between these two. And I'm a most deaf fan. And I know that most deaf you know, kills it on the mic. But there's been lots of times where Drake has killed it as well. Go ahead. That clip? Go ahead. What was that clip of uh, Go ahead. DMX? I think he was at the Breakfast Club. And they asked about Drake. He said, you know, I don't like Drake. I don't like Drake. I mean, I don't like nothing about Drake. You know, he, and he shitted on Drake. Right. Um, I'm not going to shit on Drake. I'm just saying, like, I, I don't know what you call that. Half singing, half rap. Well, but he doesn't always do that. There's albums that are just pretty much all rap. And you think he's a great lyricist? Yeah, I do. You put him up there with Black Thought? Yeah. Well, I'll put him up there with everybody. I think Drake is one of the greats. I think he'll be remembered as one of the greats. I think that his track record is up there with the greats. He's outsold pretty much all the So greats. when Black Thought did that thing on... Uh, uh, the freestyle? The freestyle. It's a little with... bit different. What do you mean? The, the ability, the ability to I'm I'm talking about recorded music. There is incredible freestylers out there, like Supernatural, all of the battle rap guys that could run circles around Drake and Jay Z and everybody else like that during live freestyles, actually live raps. But what I'm talking about is recorded music, which I think like is for is, radio play. Well, not radio play, just albums, just recorded music, non live, not spur of the moment. Can Drake freestyle? Probably not. I've never heard him freestyle. But you know what I'm saying? And most, de oh, I'm sorry, Black Thought's freestyle on Funk Flex was phenomenal. One of the best freestyles I've ever heard. One take off the dome, perfectly put but, together. But when you say we talking about lyricists, you yeah. put them up there with anybody. Yes. So even though it was a freestyle, uh, uh, Black Thought, we talking about him being a lyricist at that moment in time. Yeah, I know. And you put Drake up there with that? I think there's some songs out there that Drake is up there with him. Yeah. I think Drake is dope. I think what Drake puts together is exceptional. You can't be at that level and just be totally mediocre and just be like... In today's age, you can. You could have I'm not a saying moment. he's not talented. You can't have a run as long as Drake and have no talent the, the requirement for what greatness is at this level in the, in the game... Is so far removed from what it used to be. Do you think Lil Wayne is great? I never was a big Lil Wayne fan. I really wasn't. I've heard and, Lil and Wayne. I know people who will say lyrically he's one I, of the best. I've heard Wayne do some shit on that mic. I have heard some verses where it's like, God damn, like he's he's murdering, he murdering just, it right listen, now. Listen, I'm 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 a catch. He's not a mumble let rapper me, by I'm any a, sense I'm of the imagination. I'm a catch hell for this, but I'm telling you, lyrically. Scarface don't do it for me. Okay. And I know he's held yeah. in godlike lore. Scarface's Tiny Desk concert was like going really viral. You know what I'm saying? Well, because Scarface is and a I great- And I met Scarface. Great guy. I know Scarface. Great fucking guy. I know Scarface. And, and my and, boy and is Willie D. And I'm, no, Willie D is my friend. Yeah. I talk to him almost every week. Scarface is an incredible storyteller. Okay. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Lyricist, I think so as well, but you know, there's a debate for that if you would like. It's just not my style. Yeah, that's all. That's not, not my sometimes style. Sometimes it comes down to a style thing. But for example, like you look at like a Playboy Cardi, and I feel like 
I don't understand anything that he says. It's all mumbles. Oh, I thought that was a woman. No, it's a guy. It's a guy. Playboy card. Hence the, the word boy in the in the name. But I, I know, but play, okay. Yeah. Or Cardi, okay, like, like Cardi B. Play, yeah, okay. Cardi plus when I think of Playboy, I think of a woman's yeah. magazine. No, no, he's, it's a guy. He, I feel, is the most popular worst rapper. The most popular the worst rapper? Yeah, the most popular worst rapper. I would give him that title. That's like- uh, The most popular worst rapper in the world right now. Meaning he's has a high degree of fame. That's like saying uh, Sandra Bernhardt is the sexiest ugly woman. Hmm. Okay. I can sort of see where you're going with this. Okay. Really? That's hard. That's hard to see. No, no. I had to think of who she is and how she looks. You know who and... Sandra Bernhardt yeah, is. Yeah, I know who she is. Yeah. yeah. Not not quite my my style of woman, but you know, I'm sure someone loves she, her. Sexy though, right? Body wise, aura, aura, aura. Uh, I don't find her very sexy. All right. Yeah, but that's just my thing. All right. That's just my thing. But you got very popular, huge rappers who can't rap a lick. Playboy Cardi, I feel, is up there as that poster boy right now. And he's huge. He's huge. Huge song. He's got a new song. But, you know, his song, he's got one of the biggest songs on Travis Scott's new album. Like, I remember uh, Travis Scott in one of his concerts, he played the song with Playboy Cardi like 10 times in a row at the concert. I'm sure that was a little weird for some of the audience, but, you know, that's not Drake. Drake actually, you could distinctly say, you know every word that he's saying, and you know that everything fits together well. And you know that's just my thing. I'll put him up there, but lots of people like you would argue with me, and, and that's fine. You know, I've been a Drake fan, even though me and him have kind of had some issues in the past. It doesn't take away from the fact that you know his track record speaks for itself. What's your favorite burger place? Uh, In and Out. In and out. Mine too. Yes. Mine too. Even though that's changing, but go ahead. It's changing? Five Guys is getting up there. Really? Man. Yeah, man. Oh, no, I like In and Out better. Oh. Five Guys is good. Some of that malt vinegar on that motherfucker. Oof. Yeah. I, I, I like In and Out. All right. In all my years on this earth, I have never heard of an In and Out closing down until it just happened in Oakland just the other day. Due to the ridiculous amount of crime in Oakland around that In and Out, in and out finally announced that they're shutting down the entire restaurant. And I used to live in Oakland, man. I I am so disappointed with Oakland right now. I just hear Chris Rock in the back of my mind. I love black people. I hate niggas. I mean, they literally showed there's a video of a, a couple of guys that just pull up to his car and pop the trunk and then take, I guess it's close to the airport. They literally take all of the person's luggage out of the trunk, put it in their own car, and drive off. And what what color way? Uh, I don't know. They're wearing uh, masks. You see the hands at all? I think they're wearing gloves. Hmm. I don't know. I I'm not going to say, oh, it's, it's definitely black people. I, I don't remember. I, I didn't say it was either. That's why I'm asking. Yeah. I'm not sure. Hmm. Oakland does have a very large black Could population. Could be some Hispanics. Could be Mexicans. Could be white guys. Who knows? Could be Filipinos. Yeah. A lot of Filipinos out there. Yeah. You know, but the fact that in and out actually said we're done. It's over. For the I, first I, time I, ever. I, I, I wish a lot. I, well, apparently, that, you know, a lot of these places are saying they're done uh, because of the theft and the crime. You know, so maybe that, you know, once people don't have access to what was convenient to them anymore, all of that nonsense comes to an end. I saw something funny uh, where there was a target. And every item was locked up with gates and yeah. padlocks, except suntan lotion. <laughs> that was free to take. That was free to take. Free to take. Suntan lotion. The, the Bay is crazy because I, you know, I'm from there, and I remember like going to a Target in Berkeley, and you just saw a kid walk in, grab a bunch of sodas, and just walk out. Right and, and like the staff is looking at me like we, we can't do nothing. We have yeah. a no chase policy. Yeah, uh, you know there's like a no bail policy now. So you know, go I, I, I right know, out. I know. And listen, I'm probably being more funny than anything, but I know that Donald Trump, with all his rhetoric, people are like this motherfucker. But I remember I saw a clip recently where I guess obviously this is old. He said, uh, 
in, in regards to the targets and the wall and all these stores that get looted, like we say, from something, something from now on, these people should be shot on sight. Yeah, I don't think that. I don't think it either. Yeah. Hmm. Like if you own shit, if that's your store and you worked your ass off to, to, to build and get that, and you know the justice system ain't gonna provide you with justice. Yeah. You know, the cops ain't gonna do nothing. At that moment, you seeing your shit be looted with no help at all. What are you feeling? What are you thinking? Anger. Okay. You know, violence. So again, I'm not saying that's what should happen. Uh, but God I, I damn it. I wouldn't mind it happening. I mean, honestly, I mean, but you see this, for example, in something like the, you know, like the Indian owned stores, like the 7-Elevens right. and stuff like that. You see people coming in and, and try to pull that shit and them motherfuckers will pull out a fucking stick. Right. Like a big long stick and just start beating a motherfucker with it and stuff like that. And it's like, all right, well, that's what you get. I always wish they could push a button and lock the doors and then have like 10 pit bulls come out. <laughs> <laughs> like, I, I just, it angers me to, to see these motherfuckers and I just go, fucking thieves. Like, people work their whole lives right. to do the right thing, to pay for shit, be upstanding citizens, yeah. they, to own this business. Yeah. And you just brazenly come in here. And, and, and what I don't understand is if you know the cops ain't gonna do nothing, you know you can't be arrested. Why are you rushing? Why are you covering your face? Show your face. So Take the time. No, listen. When I saw in Berkeley at Target, he didn't even cover his face. Literally walked in, grabbed a bunch of shit that he wanted, and just walked. But right most out. times, people either cover their face or they rush. Yeah. Take your time. Take your time. Nothing's gonna happen. Nothing's gonna happen. Yeah. Throw your earbuds in. Get a cart. And shop. shop. Enjoy yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Ask questions. Well, Larsa Pippen and Marcus Jordan are still going strong. Larsa is 49. Marcus is 33. 16-year age gap. Uh, Larsa claims that they have sex five times a night. Oh, this broad is killing <laughs> she this is, guy. Uh, she's frozen her eggs for future plans to have kids with Marcus Jordan. Marcus wants his dad, Michael Jordan, to be the best man in their wedding. This is the richest, pettiest TV show I've ever seen. <laughs> the fact that she would even mention that she fucks this kid five times a day, that's so uh, trying to get uh, under Pippin's skin. Well, but you know what's funny is that she mentioned in another interview that during the course of Scotty's uh, marriage to her, that... They used to, he used to have, have sex with her like five times a day. And with she Scotty. Sex with Scotty. With Scotty. Right. You know, what's actually wild. He, he, here's what's wild, right? I, did, I didn't know about this. This part actually isn't out yet. But John Sally, who used to play on the Bulls with Scotty yeah. Pippen, uh -huh. used to say that when they were traveling, when they were on the plane going city to city, Larsa was right there with Scotty. And I said, is that common? He goes, not at all. You never see wives or girlfriends, right? Uh, you know, going on the road. But Scotty had her right there on the plane with him. Oh, is that right? In the hotel with him. And I remember Scotty. You know, she she was on the road all the time. I think in Houston, she was always on the road, always going places with him. She needs that up close, tight validation. Is, is that coming. common to bring never. wives? No, or never. girlfriends. So never. nobody, nobody brings their girls never. on the road. Really? Yeah. You didn't ask why they, I, I, you just don't do that. Why is that? Because that's, you because didn't bring throw, your- Throws you off? No or? one brings their wife to work. It's not bring your wife to work day. Aha, but Scotty was the opposite. Yeah. Oh, Which is wild. That must have been when he was in love. Oh, he was definitely in love. Oh yeah, yeah. They got a bunch of kids together. Yeah, yeah. But it's, it's just wild to see. And you know that Larsa actually got a piece of Scotty's pension. During the divorce. I know how you feel about this. Goddamn shame. I, I'm poking the bear right now. Yeah, you are. <laughs> poke, poke, poke. Fucking Shane Mosley's wife got the belts. Oh, really? Yeah. She got his belts? She got his belts. What's that even worth? I don't know, but you know you know what he did to get those belts? Did yeah. Did she? No. Did she take punches, do road work at three in the morning? Well, I don't know. What Sacrifice her diet? and I don't, yeah, I don't know. Come on, man. I, I don't know. The belts? The belts. Yeah. 
That's his legacy. Let him keep the belts. Yeah. I mean, but the belts aren't really even, I mean, I guess you could resell them, but it's not. I'm sure you could get something for them. But it's not like a, a million dollars no, a belt. No, like, no, you know, but it it's his be, legacy. Know, 10, it's his hard work. Thousand. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that, that looks like uh, a messy divorce, really. Aren't, aren't they all? Aren't yeah, they well, all? no, not always. Sometimes, sometimes people, you know, will say, okay, look, this is fair. All right, we'll agree to it for it to be fair, and we keep it moving. Yeah, well, those women are like dinosaurs, man. Those are rare <laughs> breed. Well, yeah, I, I had uh, Sebastian Telfair, the basketball player, come on my show, and he went off on NBA Wives. He basically says there's a 90% divorce rate in the NBA, and it's almost always after the player retires. Mm. He actually sees that divorces are a source of wealth for the women in the NBA. Absolutely. He got married at 21. And he said that was just one of the worst decisions. Yeah. And he also points out how, like, you know, for example, we're talking about Joe Smith. Joe Smith had, like, four side kids on his wife. She stayed with him until no other team wanted him. And then she divorced him right then. Who was the player recently that found out his wife had my only fans? Joe Smith. Oh, I interviewed him and his wife, separate occasions. Yeah. Are, are they still together? I mean, technically, yeah. Oh, Jesus. I mean, he's they're separated. He's living in a separate house right now, but... Uh, uh, he's living in another wing of the mansion? They don't have a mansion. They're actually struggling. That's actually the, the the weird part about this whole situation was that he made, like, I don't know, like $30 million or something in the course of his career, but between a lot of bad investments... A, a messy divorce, not managing his money. A few years later, he was like thirty thousand in debt. Well, what the fuck? He upset his wife. Got my only fans for. Well, she's helping. That's the whole thing. She that's the help. rebound. That that's what I'm saying. She married him when he was broke. Yeah. Right. And she was a former porn star. Oh. I didn't oh, know you, oh, you know that part? No. Yeah. Uh, Keith. Man, let that bitch work. <laughs> she's gonna save your marriage. Right. Because she was. What she said was. Because, you know, you want to hear both sides of the story. What she said was, we were broke. I was stripping at 50 years old mm. in Atlanta. He would, I'm like, did he know about it? He would drop me off at the strip club in my car. Because he didn't have a car anymore. <laughs> so I'm doing OnlyFans. I'm doing what I got to do. Yeah, bravo. Good girl. It was nice to see a balance to that. Was he mad? Well, he was mad because he didn't know until he found out. And then she recorded him. She recorded the argument and then put it out without him knowing. It was really more of an embarrassment thing than right, like a, right. a logistical thing. Because he said, had she told him about it, he would have been more or less okay with it. Because uh. she wasn't doing like sex scenes with other guys. She was doing like solo content right, or whatever right, else. Right, right, right. But yeah, man, 90% divorce rate. Um, you know, it, it's... You know, and he kind of just went into detail. He goes, yeah, the reason why these women will stay with these NBA players because they don't want some other chick at the games, you know, in the front row watching right, them right, right there. Right. They, they, they want to be the basketball wife. They, they want the prestige yeah. or whatever. You know, like, look, if this man is cheating and you realize y'all don't get along, break up with him as, you know, a second year. But they stay the whole time. To get that money. Until Bam. they retire, no other team wants them, and that's when they come in and... and Hit him with the divorce. The whole game. Well, you know, and Nia Long and uh, Aime Yudoka, they finally settled uh, their child custody situation. She's getting 32000 per month. Now, he is a head coach for an NBA team, and he makes $6.75 million a year. Before taxes or after taxes? Before taxes. So really, he doesn't make that. He makes almost half of that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Three and a half million a year. Okay, so is 13000 a month going to send him to the poorhouse? 32000 no. Oh, thir oh $32,000? Yes. Oh. Child support. Oh. Yeah, that that that, that hits a little That's 384000 Yeah, About 10%. I mean, it's still not going to set him to the poorhouse, but damn. It's based on her salary. And she's a working actress, isn't she? What's the last movie she was in? She was a working actress. I don't think she is anymore. Boy, this game is cold as a motherfucker, man. Cold game. Jesus.
Well, speaking of movies, uh, one of my members, uh, Cashmere Black, 8503, he had pointed out that you were in a movie called Out of Sync. Yes. With, with LL, LL Cool J. Yeah. What was that like? I mean, it was awesome because, you know, I grew up, one of my first rap albums ever was I'm Bad. I'm Bad. You know what I mean? So, cool J. So, yeah. Cool uh, J. Uh, um, I was always an LL fan. And then, too, I'm, you know, at that age, I'm, was I even, I think, 19, 20? You know, I'm doing a, listen, everything was such a first for me. I'm in LA. I'm 19, 20 years old. I'm working with one of my rap heroes. You know, I'm, I'm I'm making decent money at the time. Yeah, I was a kid in a candy store. You know? Any interesting stories with LL on set? Uh, not really. It, you know, LL was, was still trying to figure out who he was as an actor. Yeah. You know what I mean? That was one of his first movies. So huh. uh, he he's come so far from that. But, you know, uh, that was one of his first movies. Um, you know... It, LL's a cool guy, um, but you could tell at moments he, he takes himself, you know, seriously. You know what I mean? Too seriously? I don't know about too seriously, but you know, his whole persona, you know what I mean, B? It's crazy, man. You know, sometimes I'll do something funny and he'll just look at me like, oh, you said a joke about me, man? <laughs> What's up? You gotta look at your lips too. Yeah, yo, I, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I remember <laughs> I, I, I uh, I, I did a thing, and I, a skit about him one time on Mad TV, and I was at a radio station in Orlando, and I guess whoever the head dude was at the time interviewed him, and he goes, hey, man, I don't know if you know, but there's this kid named Ari Spears that does you. What do you think about that? And in, and in the clip, you could tell LL starts out complimentary. But then towards the end, he's a little pissed. <laughs> he's like, you know, Ari Spears is like my cousin, man. You know, family, man. You know, <laughs> you know, he does the impression. I seen it. It's cool. But you know, I'm gonna get it, I'm gonna get his ass back. I'm gonna get him on wax, B. Word up. I'm gonna get the nigga. So 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 Did he ever get you back or No, <laughs> but but you know, I, I you could tell if you hung around L, you could tell during his bravado and his cadence, right. you know. He can't laugh at himself, baby. No, nah, no. Nah, what nah. didn't he get into a fist fight with uh Jamie Foxx? On, on, uh, on uh, any, given any, any given Sunday, yeah, 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 which is one of the funniest stories ever, because he was like, uh, LL was taking the fact that he was playing a football player in the movie mm. so serious when Jamie knew, dude, we're actors, man, we're not, <laughs> we're NFL not football players. players, yeah, and so he's Jamie was like, <laughs> during one of the scenes, they had to uh, leave the tunnel and hit the field, mm -hmm. and he was like, LL was like, yo, come on, man, we got practice, B. <laughs> and Jamie was like, he was like, what? And Jamie was kind of <laughs> like lally, like like taking his time to get to the field. And LL was getting mad. And he was, he said LL was tapping him. Yo, man, come on, man, cut the shenanigans. Yo, we got practice, man. Like like they was really. So he was like giving LL shit. Like yo, dog, we, we stop hitting me so hard during these hit scenes. We're fucking actors. And so then yeah, shit escalated from there, and you know a fist fight ensued. Mm. Now, with all the impressions you've done of dozens and dozens of celebrities, have you ever had anyone roll up on you upset in person? Nah, you know, uh, well, two things. Uh, it, was, it was interesting because, again, what's so what I find so surreal about who I am in my career is that, again, when a lot of the people that I meet, when they... I was a kid when they were doing their thing. Mm -hmm. So I grew up on certain people. I grew up on LL. I grew up on Bobby Brown. And I know Bobby. Bobby's my guy. And I and I recently flew back on a flight with him from Dallas. We were both in uh, DC. I was performing at the Improv. He had a show. I didn't know until I saw him at the airport. And so uh, by the time we got back to Burbank Airport, I took a picture with him, let him know, hey, Bobby, man, you know, I noticed this. We've been knowing each other. We got each other's number. We talk. But I'm telling you for the first time, dude, this is surreal to me because I remember I used to serenade white girls in high school and junior high to tenderoni. That's how I tried to get white pussy. And he was dying laughing. And I, I remember I saw him on an interview with The Breakfast Club and Charlamagne asked him, yo, uh, in terms of sketches, because there's been a lot of people that have done sketches on you and Whitney, Saturday Night Live, Mad TV, and Living Color. 
He goes, is there any been anybody that's ever like, you know what I'm saying, you you upset you? He said, nah, he didn't really upset me, but there was a couple of times I wanted to put Harry Spears in a corner. <laughs> like just grab him up and put him in a corner. Okay. Uh but the uh the weirdest one was I remember uh Method Man and Red Man did bad TV. Mm. And I hung out with Red Man uh at his hotel. And he was like, yo, man, I'm getting ready to go to the Jay-Z concert at the Staples Center. I said, yo, nigga, let me roll with you. He was like, let's go. So we get there, and I'm in the the, the, the tunnel where a lot of the stars are. And at this time, I had my comedy CD, and I did a bunch of skits where I did prank phone calls as rappers. And I saw Busta Rhymes. I saw this person, that person. I was like, yo, I need y'all to endorse my joint. So I put him on camera saying, yo, you got to cop my man, Aerie Spears shit, blah, 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 blah. All good. I see DMX and uh, <laughs> yo, uh, <laughs> yo, X, he goes, Doug, I need to holler at you. Come here. So we go into the locker room and there's one entrance in and one entrance out. So me and him go in there and about 27 niggas follow suit. <laughs> at first it was just me and him, but then 27 niggas come in and they make a circle around us. Uh. So it's just me and X in the middle. And then the bodyguard comes in and then slams the door where you could leave and stands in front of it. Oh. So I was like, uh, yo, X, man, I got my CD. I was hoping he was like, dog, dog. I heard you, I heard you, you my voice, huh? I heard you doing some things with my voice. It was good. I said, oh, no, 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 it's all complimentary. You know, ain't nothing crazy. I'm not disrespecting you or nothing like that. So I go, um, but like everybody else, can I get you on camera endorsing my shit? He was like, dog, I'll tell you what. Come to my hotel tomorrow. Let me hear it. If it's good, yeah. If it's not, <laughs> And what really fucked me up was after he went, didn't this nigga pulled a, a razor blade out from under his tongue. Oh. The only other time I've seen this is in the movie uh, Above the Rim when Tupac's character, forget what his name was, Bernie. But Bernie. Yeah. But he went and pulled a razor blade from out for his tongue. And I said, listen, I've been black my whole life. I'm not that black. <laughs> the, the, the gift that you have to be able to put a razor blade in your mouth, talk, move your mouth, your tongue, and you don't cut yourself? Yeah, I'm not that black. Uh. And when he, between the razor blade and the come back tomorrow, uh huh. Uh, I, I never saw that. You, you yeah. never went to that hotel room. Oh, nah. Okay. Nah. <clears throat> nah. Nah. Yeah, I mean, uh, we were supposed but to- But I seen X way after that, and he, yeah. was, he was cool. He forgot about yeah, all that? Yeah, he was cool. Uh, we were supposed to actually interview uh, DMX, and uh, we had paid him and everything, and he died. Oh, shit. Yeah. You know, it, it was crazy. You, you know? know so, so when people were like, you know, after that, when people are like, yo, I want to do an interview and I need all my money up front, it's like, well, let me tell you about the situation <laughs> when we did that, where it didn't work out for us, okay? Right, right. So unless you can guarantee that you're going to stay alive, which you cannot do, right? I'll just pay you afterwards. Okay. You know, um, X was such a, a different spirit, man. I remember oh, yeah. one time uh, we were at the, uh, the Cheesecake, uh, 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 you remember Jerry's Deli? How yeah. long have you been out here? In LA, yeah. I remember yeah, Jerry's right Deli. by the Beverly Center. Yeah. And back in the 90s, that used to be the- After hour spot. Oh! Yeah, I know. When the clubs let out, yeah, that's where all goes to Jerry's. Everybody went to Jerry's. It's like the Waffle House of LA. Yes. That's what it is. Uh, so X came in there and uh, I had lost contact with him. So, you know, he's by the bathroom and my seat was by the bathroom. So I get up and I go, hey X man, it's been a minute, my nigga. Um, you don't mind if we exchange numbers again? He's like, dog, take my number down. So I'm getting ready to take his number down. And as we're standing by the bathroom, this big fat black chick comes out of the female bathroom. And as she walks by, he's in the middle of giving me his number. He just looked at her up and down and then looked at me and went like this. He went, huh, ham. He just called her ham for some reason. I, I couldn't make sense of it, but it was, he was just like, yo, my number's sometimes, huh, 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 ham. And, and then went back to giving me the number. <laughs> he just was, <laughs> he was wired different, man. I mean, he had, because uh, because I was preparing for the interview, it was like he had a very rough life. 
Oh my yeah. God. Everyone who says they have a hard life. Right. His mom knocked out like half of his teeth when he was younger. Well, he, she claimed he, you well, know, that. Well, well, now that explains this. When he did Mad TV, we did the famous skit, which is a classic. Everybody loved it, where I played his mother. And this is another reason why, let me go back to the men in a dress thing. I played his mother. So this concept was he was getting off the road, come see moms. He he met a chick and he wanted her to love him for Earl Simmons, mm. not the persona DMX. Yeah. So he came to me for some motherly advice. And of course, I had the granny wig on, the glasses with the chain. Mm -hmm. I had a dress on with Tim's. <laughs> so he's like, yo, ma, I need help with these women. I'm like, yo, son, let me, t let me holler at you. Tell you about these bitches. So the whole time is me and him doing that. Funny as fuck, but at first he didn't want to do the skit. And the head writer, Devon, I was like, why not? It's funny. He was like, uh, you know, he didn't really read it. He just heard something about him interacting with his mother. So I guess that hit a soft spot. Oh yeah. But then once he read the skit, he was like, oh, this is funny. It's crazy about his story with his mother. Like when he was a kid, I think he was maybe like six years old or something. He like went to her wallet and was drawing on like her time card. And when she found it, she beat him with a broom handle and knocked out like half of his teeth. Yeah. And then she left him in foster care. And I remember he was even describing how he would like, mommy, where are you going? And then just see the car. Right. And then now he's in foster care. Right. The reason why he loved dogs was because he was homeless and he would sleep on roofs and he would surround himself with these dogs as security in case someone tried to sneak up on him and, right. you know, rob from him or assault him in some type of way. And, you know, he had serious drug issues by the time he got signed. Like it was, it was, you know, but he was missing like half his teeth Wow, from his mom. And it's, yeah, man, his, his story was, was, you know, that's why it comes out so strong and so emotional is because yeah. it's coming from such a place of hurt. And I really wish we could have done that interview. One of my favorite songs from him, uh, Slippin'. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people love that song. Oh my God. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people love that song. 